Could I have a board member to the table, please? September 12, 2013, regular meeting number three of the Fairfax County School Board will now come to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, a moment of silence, and the performance of the national anthem by Elizabeth Carlson, a junior at Marshall High School. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched or so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled was a wonderful performance by a Elizabeth Carson, a junior at Marshall High School. Thank you, Elizabeth. Mr. Yes, Moon, just board members might not want to know this, but Elizabeth was featured in our film this summer at the Leadership Institute. Remember that I hope she superintends. Oh, yes. That is Elizabeth. Beautiful and job. We thank her for being here tonight. And she also sang national anthem at the summer graduation at Lake Braddock. A few announcements before we begin tonight's meeting. I know that Mr. Mr. Dan Stork uh, is on his way from a back to school night. Uh, if you would like to access tonight's agenda and related meeting documents, you can do so by going to the FCPA's website, select school board, and then upcoming meetings and agendas. The FCPS wireless network and access to the internet is available in the auditorium. Directions for accessing the network are available on the table by the auditorium entrance. If you have signed up to speak before the board during citizen participation, please turn in 16 copies of your remarks at this time to the deputy clerk sitting in the, direction, in the section to my right. If you would like, a, like to review a copy of the agenda and an agenda item that is being discussed tonight, 
That information is also on the table by the auditorium entrance. Okay, please turn off or silence your cell phone. And I see a former school board member, Tina Hong. Would you like to stand for recognition? <laughs> Let me call on Mr. Ash for announcements, if you have. Well, uh, the students are all back to school now. And uh, I know I'm just starting to get settled. Um, I'm, I've started selecting my student representatives to the advisory committees. And I believe I have a few appointments uh, that will be approved tonight. And I hope to start scheduling school visits uh, soon. So, um, so, yeah, that's where I am. Okay, thank you. That's exciting, Mr. Ash. And let me call on Mr. Verkov for a resolution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, a resolution supporting the Virginia School Boards Association and Nor Norfolk City School Board lawsuit regarding the OEI. Whereas the General Assembly approved and the governor signed legislation during the 2013 session creating the Opportunity at Educational Institution, OEI, and the Opportunity Educational Institution Board requiring a statewide board to take over public, local public schools in the Commonwealth that have been rated as accreditation denied and would authorize that same board to take over any local public school rated as accredited with warning for three consecutive years. And whereas, it is the firm convi conviction of the Fairfax County School Board that this legislation violates the Constitution of Virginia by usurping the role of local school boards in supervising and managing the local public schools of the Commonwealth. And whereas, while it is clear that the Constitution of Virginia vests this supervision and management role in local school boards, it is equally clear to every duly elected and appointed school board that such a role carries with it the responsibility to ensure the highest quality education for its students and that persistent school underperformance is unacceptable and must be addressed. And whereas the Fairfax County School Board believes that solutions to school underperformance will only be effective if they are delivered collaboratively within a local community, if they include a discussion about appropriate and comprehensive policy interventions targeted both to individual school situations and to the context of the broader local population in which a school operates. And while funding is not the sole determinant of success, if they are paired with meaningful and adequate resources to ensure their appropriate implementation, none of which are elements of the state's OEI legislation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board supports the lawsuit brought forth by the Virginia School Boards Association and Norfolk City School Board to declare the OEI legislation unconstitutional and to enjoin the OEI Board from taking any action to implement the legislation. And be it further resolved that the Fairfax County School Board urges the state to redirect its efforts to improving individual school, school performance towards meaningful, collaborative, community-based policy solutions and toward providing both the assistance and the resources required to implement those solutions for the students of the Commonwealth. I so move. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Hines. Uh, Mr. Berkov, you want to speak on your motion? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I call upon my colleagues to approve this resolution. With our action, we will send Richmond a message that this board will not idly sit by when locally governed public schools are undermined. As you just heard from the resolution, earlier this year, the General Assembly created the Opportunity Educational Institution, a state entity that will take over schools deemed by the Commonwealth to be failing. The city of Norfolk is challenging the law on the grounds that the Constitution of Virginia invests such authority only in local school boards. We should note that even if the Norfolk City School Board prevails, this issue is unlikely to go away. The House of Delegates has already approved a constitutional amendment that if it were sent to the voters and passed, would achieve the same end. 
As you know, another new law calls for labeling schools with grades A through F. Since we know from the PISA pilot and the tipping point study that test scores correlate strongly with the socioeconomic makeup of schools, this law does nothing more than reward the wealthy for being wealthy and punish the poor for being poor. My concerns don't end with these two laws. Every year in the General Assembly, we see bills introduced that foster charter schools, promote school choice, and grant tuition vouchers. Such proposals will exacerbate, not ameliorate, the persistent achievement gaps that characterize the children who come into this world with the fewest resources and the greatest needs. I fear that the effect of such reforms will be a trifurcated school system, private schools for the elites, good public schools for the highly motivated, and severely challenged public schools for everyone else. I hope that is not the legacy we bequeath to our children. I urge you to support this resolution and by so doing, make clear that the Fairfax County School Board will vigorously defend high quality public education for all children. Thank you, Mr. Valkoff. Ms. Hines, on your second. Just briefly, I think Mr. Valkoff did an excellent job. Thank you. Um, um, I would just say that if you followed education policy, you know that this is a reform initiative, a reform quote unquote effort that has uh, been tried elsewhere and failed elsewhere. It doesn't work because local control is extremely important, is necessary for good public schools. Um, attacks on local control of public schools are attacks on public schools. Fortunately, in Virginia, the Constitution of Virginia protects us. And so I think it's very important that we join the VSBA and other school districts who are um, opposing this legislation. I have a Mr. McElvin to be followed by Ms. Uh, Ms. Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Supporting the Opportunity Education Institution is like coming down with a disease, blaming your doctor for it, and then switching to a new doctor before your current doctor has had a chance to treat it. It is a policy idea that was adopted, uh, or adapted from one that was put in place in Louisiana, which happens to rank 46th in the country for K-12 achievement and 46th in the country for chance of student success compared to Virginia's eighth and ninth place rankings on both of those measures. Clearly, our legislature thinks we don't have enough education problems to deal with, so Virginia needed to borrow some from another state. Tonight, I have a message for our legislature. You show me a failing school, and I'll show you a state government that is failing at schools by not funding them adequately. You show me a school that needs intervention, and I'll show you a state that has intervened in our local school districts so much that our teachers are throwing up their hands and saying they've had enough. You give me one example of a group of people that could possibly know more about governing Fairfax County Public Schools than this school board, and I'll show you an example of state government that has disregarded the views of local school boards quite a few times this past year and over the past decade. You, Virginia legislature, have overstepped your constitutional authority, and your lar largest county, Fairfax County, is sending you a message tonight. Turn this ship around, or we're prepared to help sink it. Next, Ms. Ms. Schultz. I never thought I heard the night where Mr. McElveen and Mr. Cuccinelli agreed. Um, this is a little bit more um, of a complex issue um, than, than maybe some of my colleagues are speaking on. Um, it is a complex educational policy issue. And I am a little bit disappointed that our colleagues, our elected um, fellow colleagues in the General Assembly, did not do more to consult with school boards um, around the Commonwealth. Uh, this is a conflict because uh, when the General Assembly passes a law and the governor approves the law, it is assumed to be uh, a lawful um, endeavor. However, the Attorney General has already said that um, he feels that, there's, that this is a problematic issue and that this may in fact be unconstitutional. So we're put into between a rock and a hard place as elected school board officials. We're constitutional officers under the Virginia Constitution. And the General Assembly has entrusted with us through existing laws and invested the authority through the Virginia Constitution for us to run the schools in our district. And I would imagine that if our constituents felt that we were not doing a good job, they would take care of that on election day. I wish that more people would pay attention to it so that um, your, your views 
are represented as parents, as property owners, as taxpayers. But this is a very serious issue when you get the General Assembly saying that they're going to decide when schools are going to be run constitutionally by the officers who've been elected to represent the constituents in their district and when they're not. Now there is an underlying problem here in that not all school divisions across the Commonwealth have as successful a school system as do we enjoy here in Fairfax County. We don't have typically f what are called failing schools. And there are schools that fail. Um, Mr. McElveen brought up, you know, show me a failing school and I'll show you a school that's failed. Well, I, I wish that every division across the Commonwealth were as successful and were as um, uh, generously benefited as, as ours here, but they're not. So there is an underlying problem that I do think needs to be addressed if there is a repeat failing school, that there is an obligation to those students and those taxpayers elsewhere in the Commonwealth. But um, I'm very conflicted on this because we have the General Assembly and the governor um, doing one thing and it is likely unconstitutional. So this is a very difficult predicament. And if you haven't paid attention to educational policy before now, this is a pretty good litmus test of um, an overreach by uh, the wrong people to do the wrong thing, maybe with the right intention. Ms. Evans? Yes, thank you. I strongly support this resolution. Um, the state legislation was uh, ill-conceived and destructive to our school systems and to our students. Um, it certainly doesn't serve our students well uh, in any way, shape, or form. Um, I fear that if this law stays in effect that it will, we will be misrepresenting many of the schools in the state of Virginia um, as failing schools when in fact they are, are simply challenged schools. We do have to serve each and every one of our children well regardless of where they are. We have to pay particular attention to um, our neediest kids but to um, have the state come in and try to be uh, providing this kind of control um, without uh, providing uh, the funding that we certainly uh, could use more of uh, it, the A through F system, I'm very concerned about that. I think that um, that could be very destructive. Um, so I would call upon our state legislatures and uh, legislators and the governor to rethink this. And um, if they really want to help us, they can provide more funding. Mrs. Strauss. I very much support this resolution and thank you for the eloquent words that have been said so far. One of the interesting pieces about the history of elected school boards in Virginia is that we fought to be able to have locally controlled elected school boards and that didn't come until 1994. The sad history of segregation in Virginia is the root of the struggle to get locally controlled schools in Virginia. I would not want to go back to a time when the power of the citizens through the ballot box lost their ability to say what they need to say about how they want their children educated. And uh, it, it is incumbent that we all make sure that our schools and our children are educated well. Every single child deserves that. But Virginia needs to go forward and not go back to a time where local control was denied. That would be a very sad thing. Mrs. McLaughlin? The start of a, a new uh, calendar year for the school board's meetings, and so I'm going to surprise my colleagues by saying I have no additional comments to make other than that I appreciate the sound and sage words of my colleagues at the board to, so far, and I want to thank Mr. Velkoff for um, his work as he continues to focus on what is happening in the state legislature and with VSBA and for bringing this um, excellent resolution to us for tonight's discussion. Okay, with that, let me call for the vote on the resolution supporting the Virginia School Board Association Norfolk City School Board lawsuit regarding the Opportunity Educational Institution. All those in favor of the resolution, raise your hand. The vote is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, before we go to the citizen participation, let me call uh, Mr. Elena Koufax for a couple of recognitions. 
Thank you, Chairman Moon. Um, on September 17th, 2013, we will celebrate U.S. Constitution Day and Citizenship Day. Constitution Day and Citizenship Day are observed each year on September 17th to commemorate the signing of the Constitution on September 17th, 1787. And it recognizes all who, who, by coming of age or by naturalization, have become citizens. Recent legislation has renamed the day as Constitution Day and Citizenship Day and are just proper observance of the day. This year, the official observance day is Tuesday, September 17th, and is the 226th anniversary of the nation's founding document. In observation, observance of Constitution Day and Citizenship Day, all schools in FCPS will be observing this day with activities that recognize the adoption of the United States Constitution and those who have become citizens under the Constitution. Schools will use a variety of curriculum resources to teach students about the importance of the Constitution and responsible citizenship. This may relate to the school board's student achievement goal three, point, goal three to demonstrate responsibility to the community and the world. Throughout the school year, high school students will have an opportunity to participate in service learning projects related to responsible citizenship, which can lead to a civic seal on their diploma. And then from September 15th through October 15th of this year, we will be celebrating National Hispanic Heritage Month. America's cultural diversity has also always been a great strength of our nation. The Hispanic American community has long and important history and of commitment to our nation's core values and the contributions of this community have helped make our country great. During National Hispanic American Heritage Month, we celebrate the many achievements of Hispanic Americans and recognize their contributions to our country. This year's theme is Hispanics, serving and leading our nation with pride and honor. In 1968, the Congress authorized President Lyndon Johnson to proclaim National Hispanic Heritage Week, and this ob observance was expanded in 1988 to a month-long celebration to honor our nation's Hispanic heritage. During this month, Americans celebrate the traditions, ancestry, and unique experience of those who trace their roots to Spain, Mexico, and the countries of Central and South America and the Caribbean. Throughout our history, Hispanic Americans have enriched the American way of life, and we recognize the millions of Hispanic Americans whose love of family, hard work, and community have helped unite us as a people and sustain us as a nation. Thank you, Ms. Daniel Koufax. Madam Clerk, is it possible for us to go back to the A, the votes, the screen where the votes were shown? This is a, this is a new feature that I want to have a board member's attention to this particular screen that in the spirit of continuous improvement and better service to the community and public that now after each vote, we'll show a screen up there showing the maker of the motion, the seconder, and who voted for what. Okay, thank you. Uh, there will be, of course, there will be on TV as well. The next order of business is 2.01 citizen participation. Fairfax County citizens who would like to address the school board should arrange to be placed on the speaker's list by signing up online at www.fcps.edu or by calling the school board office at 571-423-1075. If the concern is a group concern, please consider appointing a spokesperson. And while the spokesperson is speaking, those in support may stand to show their support. The school board will not hear statements involving issues that have been scheduled for public hearings, such as capital improvement program, budget, and boundaries, or personal attacks on any person. Complaints regarding individual students or school-based employees should not be raised at public meetings. Any such concerns should be directed to the appropriate school principal or other school officials. Citizens are encouraged to write the board on any school-related topic. Speakers are requested to limit their remarks to not more than three minutes 
and provide at least 16 copies of their presentation for distribution to the board. Tonight, 10 citizens have signed up to address the board. Louis Epstein, Susan Marie, Mary Jo Clark, Kevin Gatesman, Sharmista Erabelli, Grace Becker, Beverly Shranko, Martina Hone, uh, Thuy Nguyen, and Rebecca Golden. We'll now view video testimony submitted by one citizen, Elliot Simon. Okay, the video presentation will come as the 11th speaker. First three speakers are Louis Epstein, uh, to be followed by Susan Marie and Mary Jo Clark. Good evening, I'm James Bradbury. I'm speaking for Louise Epstein, or in place of Louise Epstein. I'm a 2012 graduate of Thomas Jefferson and I start my sophomore year of college in a week, so I'm not uh, missing school to be here. I'm here because I know how special TJ is and I care deeply about ensuring that this amazing institution can continue to provide the exceptional educational environment that I saw firsthand. I'm concerned that the problems that TJ math teachers identified over a year ago when they wrote that a third of the freshman class had been recommended for remediation in math or science aren't going away. Instead, they're becoming the new normal. TJ has and will continue to adapt by diverting resources to remediation and tutoring, but only at the expense of the school's core mission. Couched in the language of policy 3355, the basic problem is as follows. The current TJ admissions process does not accurately assess students, quote, ability to meet the rigors of a demanding curriculum because the, quote, high mi specific minimum standards do not capture what should be the foundational prerequisite for TJ admissions, demonstration of TJ level aptitude for mathematics, either because the test is not rigorous enough, because standards are not high enough, or because the test is not given enough weight beyond the semifinal round, and most likely due to some combination of these problems. This prerequisite is not being met by a large fraction of admitted freshmen. This problem touches on two questions which are more political. The first is how STEM-focused TJ should be. Some connect this question to the admissions crisis by arguing that because the TJ admissions process includes a verbal test and several written components, the process is currently skewed too much towards measurement of verbal skills. But the essays that TJ applicants write aren't scored for writing quality at all. And it's not verbal skills that the admissions process currently overemphasizes, it's passion for STEM as imperfectly conveyed in a timed essay written by a 14-year-old. The second political question is why TJ's student body so poorly represents the diverse student population of this county. But as the admissions committee and others have made clear, this is a problem that is present throughout the entire pipeline, and no change in the TJ admissions process can bring about significant progress on its own. It may in fact be that a well-intentioned change to the admissions process to emphasize passion over aptitude in order to find students interested in STEM who weren't reached by current AAP GTP programs has contributed to the present admissions crisis without actually improving the diversity of the admit class. These are important debates, but the board should maintain a sharp focus on the specific problems that TJ currently faces and the specific things it can do to solve them. The TJ admissions math test should be modified to be more rigorous, possibly with a supplement for applicants who have completed Algebra 1 that tests concepts and material from that class. As a prerequisite for admission, students should be required to perform on this test at a level that demonstrates that they are ready for TJ math classes, a standard of TJ level aptitude that is more concrete and targetable than excellent or exceptional quantitative skills. From among the group of students who meet this standard, the admissions committee should then select a freshman class using an intelligent, holistic evaluation system redesigned to once again give applicants the opportunity to demonstrate rather than merely claim their interest in STEM. Thank you. That was a perfect timing, Mr. Bradbury. The next speaker is Susan Marie to be followed by Mary Jo Clark and Kevin Gatesman. Good evening, uh, members of the school board, Dr. Garza, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm a member of FCAG, Fairfax County Association for the Gifted, and also a concerned citizen. Year after year, we parents hear that uh, students that are exceptionally qualified for TJ are not getting in. And we also hear the teachers' concerns that they expressed in the April 2012 letter about the excessive remediation in mathematics and STEM courses that's going on in TJ. And these and other problems are raised not only by the teachers, but also by school administrators, parents, TJ alum, and TJ students alike. 
Voting in favor of the proposed changes to policy 3355 will provide a foundation for meaningful improvements to be made to help FCPS, one, stop rejecting strong STEM students, two, reduce the need for remediation at TJ, and three, meet the educational needs of students who genuinely need the curriculum and community that TJ provides. So how will the changes do that? First, the changes will help ensure that the students admitted to TJ are actually prepared for the TJ STEM-focused curriculum. The teachers have analyzed the root causes and attribute the causes to the current problems mainly to the low standards of the math test and admissions and also to inappropriate weights put on the admission process components. Students are admitted to TJ who don't have the chops to be there. That's what the teachers are saying. Second, the phrase exceptional quantitative skill of skills that's proposed is broad enough to include all students with the critical thinking and analytical problem solving skills that are needed at TJ. Exceptional quantitative skills is much broader than students who are AMC 8 or math count stars. You can see on the attachment that I have here that last year 122 FCPS 8th graders in total received AMC 8 honors or distinguished honors and on average it's 141, and TJ admits 480 students. At the same time, AMC 8 and Math Count's participation is a very clear demonstration of the strong aptitude and passion for STEM and the ability to collaborate with peers and to do well in problem solving. But exceptional quantitative skills means that students who have clearly, clearly demonstrated an aptitude for math at the level that is needed to succeed at TJ courses, plain and simple. Uh, thirdly, the changes to the policy will help TJ fulfill its potential or, and its purpose of preparing students for STEM-focused prof professions. That's the mission of TJ. That's its purpose. I work for MITRE Corporation, which is a research and development company. I work for AT&T Bell Laboratories and IBM. My husband and I collectively had worked for nine STEM companies. STEM companies hire students who have strong quantitative skills. That's the people, the students that they give the internships to. If TJ aims to foster a vital pool of successful STEM professionals, then the policy must include exceptional quantitative skills. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Mary Jo Clark to be followed by Kevin Gatesman and Sharmista Arabelli. Good evening. My name is Aaron Clark. My wife, Mary Jo, could not be here to speak this evening. Our two children attended Franconia, Springfield Estates, and Haycock Elementary Schools, as well as Longfellow Middle and TJ. When we first moved to Fairfax County 15 years ago, our oldest child was enrolled into kindergarten at Franconia within the Edison High School Pyramid in Cluster 5. His second grade, he qualified for the GT program and he attended Springfield Estates for third and fourth grades. During his second week in fourth grade, after three days spent on the same math lesson and classmates still not grasping the concept, he was tired of being bored and frustrated. Mary Jo asked his teacher what could be done to provide challenge or enrichment, and the teacher said that he could give him a few problems from another math book, but if she advanced him then, what would he do when he was in sixth or seventh grade? The teacher's question baffled us. How would she hold back a student instead of letting him go as far as he could? There was no grasp of the obligation to meet students' needs for advanced math and no vision of the potential of these children. My wife gave our son his grandmother's high school plain geometry textbook and he was thrilled to open it to a problem he didn't already know how to answer. He flipped back in the pages to find the part that could teach him what he needed to know how to solve the problem. He was nine years old. I was given a job assignment in Florida in 2002, and our son spent fifth through seventh grades in the Okaloosa County public school system. The learning environment was proactive, and the teachers provided challenging opportunities. In sixth and seventh grades, he took algebra and geometry in middle school classrooms and participated in math counts, American Mathematics Contests, the AMC, and Mu Alpha Theta High School Math Competitions. When we relocated back to Fairfax County in 2005, he was ready to enter eighth grade. My wife visited Twain Middle School that summer to ask what options were available for our son to take Algebra II. She was told he could take the course online or he could go to Edison High School for the class, where the IB math program did not offer post-AP math rigor that we were really ultimately seeking. Looking for other possibilities, Mary Jo came across Longfellow Middle School, which has an in-school Algebra II trigonometry class and an outstanding music program. Our son, I still remember this very clearly, math and band, what more could I want? Rather than move back into our lovely home here in Franconia, 
we rented an older, small town, townhouse in Falls Church so that we could enroll our children at Longfellow and Haycock, where they both thrived. We feel fortunate that our children made it through the TJ admissions gauntlet. My son went on to take AP Calculus as a freshman. TJ is the only school in Fairfax County that could meet his needs, and the admissions process needs to acknowledge that math is the foundation and backbone to science and technology and engineering. Both kids are in college now studying to be engineers. Aerospace at MIT for my son, mechanical down at Virginia Tech. Both students graduated from TJ. My wife's remarks follow in the written testimony. Thank you. Thank you. The next, the next speaker is, I know that Dr. Dare is on his way to speak in place of Kevin Gatesman, to be followed by Shulmista Rebelli and Grace Becker. Uh, I apologize for not providing you a written copy in advance. I was working all day at school and I didn't manage to write one until 10 minutes ago, so I sent it to you by email. Um, I'm sorry. So uh, Chairman Moon, um, distinguished board members, uh, Madam Superintendent, is that proper? I don't know. Um, so I come to speak tonight as a TJ science teacher and as a scientist. I'm going to sort of make uh, comments with one of, with those hats on at different times. Um, my background is I've taught physics at TJ for a little over 24 years. I have taught all the physics courses that the school has to offer, trained as a theoretical physicist before joining the, the faculty at TJ. I taught and worked in some of the country's outstanding university research environments, including Yale, the University of, uh, of, the university of Texas at Austin, hometown, uh, as well as similar institutions around the world, including the University of Paris, the University of Windsor in Ontario, and also with brief stints at a number of research institutes, including the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Since joining the TJ faculty, I have also served, rather more recently, as academic director of summer research institutes for high school students at MIT and KAUST, that's King Abdul University for Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. I believe that by experience, I'm well acquainted with the process of high school students taking their first steps as novice scientists and mathematicians over the last 24 years. So my first comment is as fundamentally as a TJ teacher. Um, I think I speak for the majority of the, of the TJ faculty when I say that it pains us all to see 15 to 20 percent of the students unable to enjoy the extraordinary opportunities the TJ has to offer because they are perpetually in tutoring and remediation just to keep their heads above water in the core science and math program. Uh, it pains us equally to know that there are, there are a like or greater number of FCPS and other stakeholder students who were rejected in the admissions process for whom TJ is a near optimal match and who would, who would revel rather than suffer under the rigor of our science, technology, and math programs. We are encouraged uh, to see pro uh, process in, the, in this uh, and motion, um, uh, see processes in motion that seem to have finally recognized these realities and that are moving to improve the situation. We understand that finding a balanced solution is indeed a difficult problem. Uh, my comment as a scientist is that there appears to be some debate about the relevance and importance of mathematics in the TJ program and to science and technology more generally. Um, there's a general work for, uh, workflow and development paradigm at work across virtually all of modern science and technology. Their paradigm is roughly design, model, build, and test. This workflow is just as valid in the development of scientific experiments and theories as it is in technology applications of these ideas. The point is that in the modern world, the model and test phases are quantitative, that is to say mathematical models. Today, and more so every day, this is the case in all forefront sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, and modern hybrids and applications. The utility of quantitative mathematical models is driven by our mushrooming amazing ability to, to apply uh, these models. Okay, I'll cut myself off. Um, the, 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 my, just the conclusion is that, um, that mathematics is clearly a, a core uh, skill that we have to take seriously if we are going to take ourselves seriously as a science and technology school. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, Dr. Dale. The next speaker is Shalmista Araberli, to be followed by Grace Becker and Beverly Dranko. Good evening, school board members and distinguished superintendent. Um, I'm here to share the experience of our daughter, Saroja. She's a junior at TJ, but spent her freshman year at Langley High. At Longfellow Middle School, Saroja enjoyed spending extra time solving competition math problems. She was disappointed when she was not admitted to TJ. Langley is a great high school, but it wasn't a good fit for Saroja. 
She was given an exception to take AP Calculus and AP Computer Science in her freshman year. These were her easiest classes, and she helped tutor seniors. While tutoring friends at TJ on introductory computer science, she learned that TJ's version of this class is taught at the level of Langley's AP Computer Science. TJ's version of AP Computer Science included topics not taught at Langley. She tried with little success to organize other Langley students to do math competitions. When she signed up for her 10th grade classes, she asked special permission to take honors physics, a course generally offered to only juniors. At Langley, she would not have any math classes after 10th grade and would run out of all advanced science classes after 11th grade. Her only choices would have been to fill her schedule with more humanities classes and or to take math science classes at GMU. Saroja's older brother, Vishal, took a 200 level computer science class at GMU after his junior year at Langley. He found the course very easy and finished with an A. However, he could not place out of Georgia Tech's version of that course since, his, since he scored only 50% on the placement test. Given Vishal's experience, we knew that GMU STEM classes were not a good option for Saroja, so she applied to enter TJ as a sophomore. Saroja was admitted only after two weeks at TJ. She commented that her chemistry class had many students who had trouble balancing chemistry equations because they lacked math ability. However, math team and computer team were the most rewarding experience. If Saroja had stayed at Langley, she probably would have taken many rigorous humanities classes and spent a lot of time studying for them. She would have become well-rounded and perhaps had more leadership positions. However, she would not have had an opportunity to develop her advanced skills to tackle a sophisticated internship in science or math. Saroja participated in national event Math Prize for Girls this past weekend at MIT. This event offers large prizes to encourage girls to do math. Saroja and another girl from TJ placed in top five. At, at the award ceremony, keynote speakers shared their experience, how their mathematics major was instrumental in developing new skills or conducting research in completely new areas. If we encourage our students to excel in math, they will be able to nurture their STEM interests throughout their lives, not just in high school. Thank you for listening. Thank you. The next speaker is Grace Becker to be followed by uh, Beverly Ranko and Martina Hong. Good evening, Chairman Moon, honorable members of the school board, Superintendent Garza, and FCPS leaders, teachers, and stakeholders. Although the TJ PTSA hasn't even had its first meeting, I'm here today to speak on behalf of our executive committee. The TJ parent leaders agree with the TJ teachers who've raised serious concerns about the most promising middle school math students who are being overlooked and the growing number, up to a third in 2012, um, of freshmen who are struggling with TJ's accelerated curriculum. And while we appreciate that strong writing skills are important for all students, the current process is skewed way too much in favor of verbal skills. Currently, it's testing only for one hour in math and three and a half hours on verbal skills, including five separate written essays. That makes no sense for a school that's focused on science, technology, engineering, and math. And there's no reason why the testing shouldn't be half verbal and half math. Now, we appreciate that FCPS has sought input from TJ math teachers in recent months, and we urge FCPS to follow their recommendation to make the math portion of the TJ admissions test appropriate for high-performing eighth graders and not the current sixth grade level. We urge FCPS to consider, consider an early admissions process for high-scoring applicants and a holistic process for semifinalists. We appreciate that the humanities, arts, music, and sports are important for all teenagers. And we respectfully urge the school board members to vote for the proposed policy, including the phrase exceptional quantitative skills. We believe that the phrase exceptional is necessary to distinguish among the over 3,000 arguably excellent applicants that apply to TJ every year. 
the students who routinely get A's in their math classes or pass advanced scores on their SOLs. That said, exceptional is not limited to math geniuses and math contest winners. Yes, they're exceptional. They're beyond exceptional. They're extraordinary. And yes, they should be a TJ, but you can't fill up a class of 480 freshmen with math geniuses. There are just not enough of them. And while more than half of TJ students are non-white, we appreciate that and encourage all students to take advantage of TJ. To do so, schools and parents must begin in elementary school. The TJ community is committed to mentoring young students as I've described in my prepared remarks. Thank you so much. The next speaker is Beverly Zhuang, to be followed by Martina Hone and Thuy Yuan. Good evening, Chairman Moon, honorable members of the school board, Superintendent Garza, and other guests. I'm speaking to you tonight on behalf of our eight board members. Our testimony is the opinion of our group, not of individuals or just a few individuals. 15 to 30 percent of students at TJ are having trouble with entry level mathematics. Something has gone wrong with the admissions process and it's impacting the quality of the school as a whole. Requisite may have sufficed at one time, but now that bar is set too low. Serious, high-level science and technology subjects cannot be accomplished without a strong base in math. FCAG recommends that you vote yes to policy 3355.4 so that you can begin the process of change immediately. However, we have some reservations about the term exceptional quantitative and hope you define it appropriately. As one FCAG board member says, the one who's in charge of our math contests, I doubt if there really are 480 exceptional math students out there every year. Another FCAG board member, a mathematics professor, says, on the national scale, many Fairfax County kids are truly exceptional. In many areas of the county, taking algebra in seventh grade means you're quite something. And here we have more than 50 kids at every center doing it. A little bit of a variation. One interpre interpretation reads exceptional as a standard so high we couldn't even fill a class at TJ. The other says there are plenty of kids who make the cut. Exceptional quantitative will certainly identify and give preference to math competition superstars, but please remember to ask yourselves where will STEM-oriented, quantitatively competent, deep and creative thinkers fit in. The point is, TJ uh, students need to be good enough at math to comfortably complete TJ's unique higher level science, math, and technology electives. One reason students are struggling is because we agree the math portion of the entrix exam is too easy. Another problem lies over in, in waiting, overweighting of verbal considerations. We know students need to be good at writing and communication, but the verbal mix shouldn't be more than 50% of the total. So we recommend the following. Make the, the math portion of the TJ test tougher, including questions with serious algebraic thinking. Add several open-ended math questions. Reduce the number of essays from two to one on the admissions test to make space for open-ended math questions. Revise the SIS to make it again an information sheet rather than a creative writing exercise. And provide a break, please, between the math and verbal sections of the TJ test. Some students are unaware that the sections are given together, given those who know an unfair advantage. In conclusion, FCAG advises FP, FCPS to interpret exceptional quantitative with some breadth. We need to include not only fast and accurate math test takers, but also deep thinkers with amazing potential in STEM. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Martina Hohn, to be followed by Thuy Yuen, Nguyen and Rebecca, Gold, Rebecca Golden. School board members, Superintendent Garza, staff. We represent the Coalition of the Silence. Tonight is our first opportunity to publicly welcome Dr. Garza to your new role and to extend our support to you. When you were selected, we were extremely optimistic and hopeful, and we continue to be. Tonight, though, we must talk about a pressing issue that preceded you. As you know, the Coalition of the Silence successfully filed a federal civil rights complaint with the U.S. Department of Education 
against FCPS over the persisting pattern of exclusion of black and Latino children from TJ and from the network of level four GT centers that feed into it. We stand firmly and unapologetically behind our complaint. We have intentionally been laying low since filing it as the federal investigation moves forward. Tonight, however, it is important to stand before all of you, the school board, the superintendent, the staff, and the community. We have to remind you that ultimately, you must resolve the issue of operating a taxpayer-funded public high school in a network of level four GT centers that have virtually no black or Latino students in it. This pattern of discrimination cannot be justified and must not be continued. We believe the majority of school board members agree with Cots. You know that there is a distortion in the process, including flat out racial bias that is leading to the exclusion of black and Latino children as early as kindergarten from the GT pipeline. You know that a network of drill and kill test factories exists that gives some students advantages in the current admissions process over others. You know that there are persisting discrepancies in the math sequences across high school pyramids, as discussed earlier tonight, that allow students in Longfellow Middle School and others to take honors geometry, while students at Twain are taught something called algebra that probably is not. Every child in Fairfax County should have the right to share in the full bounty of everything this county has to offer. Whether your parent can afford to rent a house in Falls Church to get you in the Long Philo Pyramid or not. Because we know that you know these things, forgive us for viewing these very modest proposed changes with skepticism. None of these changes on their own will do much to resolve the blatant discrimination that exists within TJ and the GT centers. Nevertheless, the tone of the proposed changes reflect a shift to a more nuanced holistic approach that will allow FCPS to identify highly qualified and meritorious students with solid math skills, but more importantly, who have a demonstrable passion for science and technology and visionary creativity that will allow them to change the world. In a genuinely unbiased and holistic, a genuinely unbiased and holistic merit-based admission process, we believe will give Cots kids a better chance. We thank you for the modest steps which we support, but we remind you You've got a long way to go. Thank you. The next speaker is Thay Nguyen, to be followed by Rebecca Golden. Good evening, Dr. Garza, Chairman Moon, and school board members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. As a member of FCAC, I strongly believe that the students admitted to TJ should demonstrate exceptional quantitative math skills. This will not only help them to be properly prepared for TJ's unique academic experience and rigor, but this will also ensure that they don't ruin their important teenage years by attending a high school where they're always struggling to thread water. My daughter, a TJ sophomore, took chemistry the past summer so that she can take an AP chemistry course this year. A lot of homework required the students to balance chemistry equations. For those for the, for the strong math students, this was no problem. However, for students with weaker math skills, the homework could be painfully time consuming. These TJ students who struggle in STEM are not enjoying themselves. They spend eighth period at TJ in remediation instead of attending school clubs. They lose sleep and forego their favorite activities to spend more time studying. They look for ways to avoid classes that require exceptional math skills. This not only affects their self-esteem, it defeats the purpose of having a regional magnet school whose goal is to select the top students and prepare them to be future leaders of the country in STEM. Um, one of my son's classmates had parents who told him to write compelling essays about his interest in Alzheimer's because he had to take care of a relative with Alzheimer's disease, which in fact was not true. Um, my son was very upset when he heard about it because he had just written a very long essay about Alzheimer's 
um, and you know, the human brain for his English class because for him, there is no way for TJ to tell the difference. If TJ wants to try and figure out where, whether 13, 14 years old likes them, it needs to start checking facts. Indicating that they have an interest or passion in STEM sounds good in theory. However, in practice, it can teach many uh, 12, 13, years, uh, 13, 14 years old to exaggerate and even lie on their TJ essays or student information sheet because they know that nobody checked to see whether they were telling the truth. If a student claims that they did science Olympiads, ask the sponsor if he showed up for more than one practice. Ask how he did in the tournament, because right now, some students are showing up for only a few practices just so that they can write something about the SIS. Last but not least, I think it would be important to have a TJ faculty, uh, a TJ math or science faculty on the admission committee. The faculty to help identify candidates whom they believe can succeed in TJ's rigorous STEM environment. Thank you. Thank you. The final speaker is Rebecca Golden. Good evening, all. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Rebecca Golden, and I'm a professor of mathematics at George Mason University where the courses are not quite as strong as at TJ. Um, I care very deeply about STEM education. I'm a member of the FCAG board, though I'm here speaking on my own behalf. I'm a parent of four children, three of whom are in the Fairfax County Public Schools. My oldest son is in eighth grade and plans to apply to TJ. My interest in math education is not only restricted to my own children, it's what I do for a living, it's what I do with my free time as I volunteer for several local math clubs. I'm here to testify in favor of the proposed change to include exceptional quantitative skills in policy 3355.4, and I want to share why and how you might implement this. Algebraic and quantitative thinking are pervasive in STEM fields. They're used to predict chemical reactions, describe Newtonian physics, assess genetic factors in biology. STEM students need facility in mathematics with very rare exception. So why support exceptional quantitative skills as opposed to requisite skills? I'm influenced greatly by teachers at TJ who note the large number of kids unprepared for the rigor at TJ. Meanwhile, middle school teachers are surprised that some of their top students don't get in while lesser qualified students do. It may be the recommendations undervalued, but poorly designed math tests also play a role. The math section of the TJ admission test test fails to differentiate students um, who deeply understand the math from those who don't. And you see top scores clustering together, which makes it very difficult to tell who really knows what they're doing. Decisions about admissions consequently depend highly on essays and student information sheets in which kids may or may not present well their fit with TJ. We're missing a lot of talent while admitting students who excel but are not best suited for handling TJ's advanced math and uh, advanced pace and intellectual standard. Equity is not served either as mediocre kids trained to write enthusiastic essays are let in over exceptional kids with less savvy parents. I suggest changes that are sensible from an educator's point of view. The math test should include algebraic reasoning and overall be more challenging. It needs to test mathematical and logical reasoning about unexpected mathematical situations. Open-ended questions involving several logical steps written by teachers will allow us to see how well students understand the math they're writing about. Teachers should be asked on recommendation forums to evaluate the mathematical and scientific thinking of the students as well as their passion for these subjects. The math test and these recommendations should be valued highly by the admissions committee. A holistic approach may allow admissions committee members to weigh heavily special accomplishments or traits or evaluate students relative to their peers, noting that kids at middle schools with more opportunities for clubs and activities should not have an advantage over kids with few opportunities. But in all case, mathematical standards need to rise and truly extraordinary children need to be accepted. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please bear with me, my computer went into sleep. Uh, there is uh, one speaker 
here at Thrill. Hello, Hero. my name is Elliot Simon, and I am making this video for the proposed. Hello, my name is Elliot Simon, and I am making this video for the proposed change to policy number 3355. I am a sophomore math major at the California Institute of Technology. I was a member of the class of 2012 at Thomas Jefferson and attended Carl Sandburg Middle School before that. A lot of people look at mathematics and they can't imagine any scenario where they've used what they've learned in algebra or calculus. The fact of the matter is that almost no one will spend their lives working textbook problems and worksheets. However, the problem with this view is that TJ has always prided itself on giving its students a broad education. Consider, for example, the science curriculum. Every student takes at least one class in bi biology, chemistry, physics, and geosystems. This approach not only exposes students to areas they otherwise may not have explored, but also has the benefit of giving graduates a very large advantage over other national students at the collegiate level. Why should we ignore math when we give such emphasis on the sciences? Many people would say that math skills have no practical use in science or in any other profession. This view is incredibly short-sighted in nature. Physics, for example, is at its core applied math. People describe math as reading some words and answering the question with a number, but physics is exactly the same process with meanings attached. Calculating energy, predicting where a thrown ball will land, understanding electricity, is all derived from the first principles of calculus, not physics. Without a knowledge of math and a strong understanding of what processes and calculations are being performed, physics is impossible. Kinetic chemistry, likewise, is extremely dependent on an understanding of differential equations. Population biology is directly based off of statistics. Every electronic device that you use, including the camera that I'm taking this video on, is, runs because of complex analysis. Every subject taught at school, in TJ or anywhere else, is at its core applied math. And without an understanding of math, you cannot excel at any other subject. In recent years, there have been many changes to the admissions policies at Thomas Jefferson. From conversations with numerous teachers and my own first-hand experience, the newest classes at TJ have had greater difficulties with the math classes offered. These difficulties not only prevent them from excelling in the math curriculum, but every other class as well. I believe that the key to maintaining TJ's exceptional achievement levels starts with a strong math education, but the current admission standards are not strict enough. TJ needs stronger math standards that will choose the students that will excel and be the mark of the nation's top high school once again. This is why I support the proposed change to policy 3355. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Simon. The next order of business is 2013 and 2014 opening of a school report, Dr. Garja. Good evening. Hi, everyone. Um, been here a little over two months. I'm excited to, to present to you a begin, the beginning of school's report, uh, but I first want to start off with, again, thanking you all for this opportunity. I'm very grateful, uh, and having been here for two and a half months, I'm very excited um, about what I'm seeing, um, and excited about the future of Fairfax County Public Schools. I'm also very grateful for the leadership team um, that's sitting right over here. They've been a delight to work with. Um, and a wonderful, very thoughtful group. So I'm very happy uh, to work with them and I, I very much appreciate their patience and support. And just all throughout the county, principals, other employees, a lot of people in this room right here uh, have demonstrated such wonderful support and it's certainly a very warm welcome and I'm very grateful uh, for that. Um, I also wanna congratulate all of our principals and our teachers for a very smooth start to the school year. I know many of you have already uh, have visited quite a number of campuses, and I'm sure you saw have seen the same thing I've seen at the campuses that I've visited, that we've had a very, very nice start. 
Um, so I, I'm very, very appreciative uh, of their hard work because that didn't happen without, uh, without a lot of preparation. So I'm very appreciative. But at the same time, I also know that it takes a lot of support from some other offices and some other places, such as transportation, getting our bus schedules ready, uh, facilities that just overnight the, the school was ready when it might, might not have been. We had a lot of construction going on, so a lot of people put a lot of, uh, lot of, lot of hours in getting our schools ready, so I'm very grateful. So I'm going to talk about, um, I'm following in my predecessor's footsteps, and I'm going to talk about some of the same things that uh, he has talked about in, in the past. And we are projecting an enrollment of 184,625 students. We won't have that official for another, about another month, another few weeks. Uh, we're working on that, but we do anticipate getting really close to 184,000, maybe a little over. Uh, we're seeing um, our ESOL population is growing. Uh, right now it's at 16 uh, uh, percent. And I will tell you in 2009, it was 12 percent. Uh, our special education uh, uh, numbers are also growing. You see the number there. Now, actually, uh, this is going down a little bit. Uh, it's 13.8 percent. In 2009, it was 14.2. I think that's probably a good sign. Uh, our free and reduced uh, lunch uh, students that are qualifying, now that number is going up. Right now, we're at 26.7%, and in 2009, we were at 21.9%. And here you'll see our projections over time. And you'll see by 2016, we're expecting to, to be over 190,000 students, which is just incredible um, to see. Of course, and that's why we see, you know, we're, we're hearing from, from schools, and we have about 990 temporary buildings throughout the, throughout the division. Here we show some of the same numbers, but in, in graph format, and you just see the increase uh, over time as our population is continuing to grow. We've been, our HR department, I saw Dr. Pajardo around here somewhere. Uh, she was, is she, she stepped out. Well, I was gonna give her a big compliment. She and her team have worked extraordinarily hard this summer. Uh, in, in hiring 1,841 new teachers, and they're still hard at work, uh, still hard at work. Uh, we've also had our school leadership teams, our principals also very involved in that effort, uh, but we appreciate, uh, we know that they've hired great teachers because they've had a lot of teachers to choose from. You'll see that we've had 26,823 teacher applications. So the word is out, people want to teach for Fairfax County Public Schools, and and there's good reason why, because we have great schools. And so uh, they're joining uh, many other thousands of great teachers in our system. We also had a wonderful um, training for our new teachers that, to welcome them and also to train them and get them well prepared for success in our schools. And so many people uh, throughout our division, uh, Dr. Terry Breeden, of course, Dr. Sloan Presidio and his team, and Dr. Dockery and so many other people uh, worked on that and, and continue to strive to support our new teachers and making sure that they're well prepared for success uh, throughout the school year. In transportation, we're a major operation. We have a little over 1,500 buses and the next, slot, the next uh, bullet is just to show a comparison. Greyhound, Inter Greyhound National, the, over the entire nation, um, has 1,775 um, buses. So it's, this is a major operation and of course we cover also 395 square miles. Uh, just today I was at Marshall High School and then I drove across to uh, the other side uh, of the school system. You know where I was today and it took me almost an hour to get there. I thought it's pretty pretty amazing. So we're uh, pretty spread out. Do what? <laughs> exactly. Um, we have uh, 1,039,000, excuse me, 139,000, a little over that, students that qualify uh, to, be, to ride the bus, and we have almost 23 million students that actually um, ride. Those are bus rides per year. And thank you, Jeff, and your team for your hard work on that. Um, I know it takes an inordinate amount of uh, time and energy to make sure that, uh, and we continue to work on it because it's very complex. And we need to make sure that students get to and from school safely. So it's very important to making sure that we pick them up on time at the right place and get them home in time. And so we know it's important to, to our parents that we, we, we do that. Lots of work was going on this summer with capital improvement projects. I visited quite a number of these this summer and continue to see quite a number of these projects. Uh, but 11 uh, additions have been completed 
adding capacity for over almost 2,500 students. Lemon Road Elementary School was finished, Union Mill Elementary, Greenbrier East Elementary, Quest, uh, excuse me, Crestwood Elementary, Lindbrook, Kings Park, Cunningham uh, Park, Spring Hill, West Springfield, Woodley Hills Elementary, and then finally Springfield Estates Elementary School. So a lot of work uh, was completed. And a lot, of, and, you know, I've visited some of these schools and they're so excited to have their completed school. Um, because it takes a lot to go through a renovation, uh, as we'll see here in just a little bit. Um, we have some renovations that are underway. Um, at Claremont Elementary School, um, Terra Center uh, Elementary will be starting relatively soon, Canterbury Woods Elementary School, and then Garfield Elementary School. And then we'll have another eight uh, schools coming, starting the process this year. Um, um, we also have uh, Sandberg Middle School uh, that's in the middle of renovation right now. Um, and we have several, uh, we have Thoreau Middle School that's getting ready to start. Um, so I know they're excited about it. Then we have Marshall High School that's currently in, under renovation for those of you that were at the uh, ribbon cutting this morning. There's a huge hole in the side of the building. <laughs> uh, so you can see that it's under, under renovation most definitely. I think it's very obvious, but what's nice is as you enter the building, there's certain portions that are completed. Um, so I know the school is very excited about seeing some of that progress happening. And then Langley is about to start. Langley, I know they're excited and seeing the design work and then getting ready to start with their renovation. And then I've attended and, and visited uh, Thomas Jefferson this summer, and in fact, I saw Will holding court there uh, when I was there visiting, touring, saw so him twice, uh, visiting with students, um, and uh, they're most definitely under renovation, um, no doubt about it. And it's a complex project. This will add, the, the renovation here will add over 200,000 square feet to the facility. Uh, it's expected to be completed in, I think, September of 17, isn't that right? It says here September of 16, but I think it's really 17, 17. Uh, but it is a major project um, that is, is underway. I know this looks very familiar to some of you. Um, I wanna compliment Megan McLaughlin and her work on this committee. Um, 13 turf fields have been put in at five, five schools. Also again, um, Jeff and his team work extraordinarily hard to get these ready. Some of them just ready right in the nick of time for football games and, and for fall sports. So uh, great work there. But it was really a collaborative effort uh, by this board, uh, the school booster clubs all throughout this county, the Board of Supervisors, the Park Authority, uh, neighborhood and community services and local sports uh, organizations, and our parents. Our parents contributed a lot of dollars to making sure that they were able to, to accomplish that for our students. Just some fast facts. Uh, we serve almost 85,000 meals um, every day. That's extraordinary. Uh, we have students uh, attending our schools from more than 200 countries and speak more than 160 languages. Um, I think that's such a strength um, to have such a diverse uh, student population. Um, our world is changing. We had students uh, that, uh, we, our students read about 2.2 million books per year online through digital formats, um, and then read about 5.4 million uh, books per year, print books. And then we had a number of schools uh, that were selected uh, for Eco Schools USA Green Flag Award, that's Churchill Road Elementary School, Centerville Elementary School, and Lanier Middle School. We have a lot of things to celebrate. We do have some challenges ahead. I'm gonna to touch on just a few of these, our achievement gaps, which we're all very concerned about and something that we're all focused on, our budget growth, our cost per pupil, and our, our teacher salaries, and I'll touch on all, all of these. Um, as you know, we've experienced some changing in our state assessment program, and as a result of that, we're kind of recalibrating, and this is throughout the entire uh, state, but you'll see there the difference uh, that occurred in mathematics in 2012 with the new assessment, uh, and that's why you see scores, the rigor was dramatically increased. Um, as a result, um, unfortunately, our gap increased. Now, this happens oftentimes with new assessments, but that's a challenge that we have to take on, um, and that is uh, mitigating the achievement gaps but improving all performance of all students uh, at the same time, and that is a lot, lot of work going on to, to address those 
uh, very, very important issues. I'm only going to touch on the achievement gaps, but in the coming months, there is a scheduled annual performance report uh, that will be presented to you all that will go in depth in all of the content areas, and you'll be able to see um, how our students are faring in all of the content areas. In, in reading, uh, you'll see there that, that the reading standards were changed just this past year, just uh, this past spring, and you'll see the same, same trend line uh, occurred with our reading assessments as well. Um, with our um, math assessments, we have about a 26 percentage point gap that we need to address, and in math, excuse me, and in reading, we have about a 24 uh, percentage uh, point gap. And we're working very hard to to identify strategies, very meaningful and strategic strategies to to address all of those issues. On our budget challenges, um, we're spending a lot of time on, on these issues, uh, making sure that we're well prepared for fiscal development of the fiscal year 15 budget. Uh, we know that we've experienced, uh, and by the way, you'll see receive a comprehensive fiscal forecast report on Monday, September the 23rd, so you'll get a lot more detail about some of these things that I will be touching on. Um, first one, the health insurance employer, um, you know, we had a big increase in our health insurance uh, for this coming year at $27 million. Uh, of course, we had the VRS rate increase, uh, employee compensation, uh, our starting salaries at $45,000 just about, which is below Arlington, Alexandria, Montgomery County, and Loudoun County. And that's a challenge that we've, we, I know, um, all uh, take on and, and want to do something about. Um, the county, um, we are projecting a 2% increase in the transfer, which is, equates to about $34.3 million. Um, that, that helps, but far, is far insufficient uh, to meet our needs. Um, the uh, state local composite index, and that is based upon our LCI projections, is will reduce our funding by about $21.3 million. Um, and then state per people funding rem remains below pre-recession levels. And I think this is very interesting. Um, this year, we're projected to spend $13,472 per student. In 2008, we spent $13,407. That's amazing to me, given the cost of benefits and employees and, and what it costs to operate a school system and as fast growth as we are, that's only um, about 60 something dollar difference uh, from that many years moving forward. Uh, and our uh, colleagues in Montgomery County spend almost $15,000 uh, per student. We're a fast growth uh, school system. Uh, since 2009, student membership has increased by 15,087 students. It's a lot of students in just the, those few years, in just six years. Um, and you'll see there's some indications of our growth uh, over time. Our cost per pupil uh, is kind of in the middle of the pack. Um, good news in that our performance is high. You know, our students, our teachers are doing a great job with the resources they have available to us as well as our principals are as well. Um, but we're, we're kind of in the middle of the pack as it relates to the monies we have available to educate children. And here we are with where we compare uh, teacher salaries. Uh, Fairfax on the starting salaries, we're about in the middle of the pack. Um, you see that we fall down just a little bit when you get kind of mid-career, which is step nine, and you'll see where we, where we rank compared to other surrounding uh, jurisdictions. I know this is a, a, a uh, priority of this board. Uh, we know that we have to have the high, best teachers we can in every classroom throughout this division, and it's so something that uh, we most definitely want to address, uh, but we do know that we have some significant challenges related to budgets uh, moving forward as well. And then at the retreat, we talked about three major priorities for this year. Uh, of course, uh, the first one being strategic planning, and I'm very excited about that work. I get more and more excited about it as we start to talk more about the details and, and move this further along. Um, there's lots of other important work going on, so this is not just all we're doing, but uh, I think these are very important goals, the first being um, the uh, strategic planning. On the student achievement goals, which are still very meaningful and important work that this board has developed some time back, uh, this year we want to develop the portrait of a graduate, which we anticipate will provide the opportunity for the community to become uh, engaged in the defining what we expect of our uh, graduates. What do we want our graduates to know and be able to do uh, when they leave high school? 
um, and use a backwards design model. So if this is what we expect of our graduates, um, then what can we expect of them at third grade or sixth grade and tie that to our passages work. And so I'm excited about that. And of course, our, our achievement gaps, which we're working diligently uh, to respond to. The second piece of that was being responsive and accountable. As a large system, we have to protect against being unfriendly uh, as a system. So we've done a few things. We will continue to work on this. Uh, we've developed a new communication structure to ensure that we're following up and being responsive to our constituents. Uh, we have a parent mobile application that will, I think, be uh, very user-friendly and, and a great tool for our parents. We will be launching that on September the 28th, I think. So be, stay tuned. I think parents will be very excited uh, about that. A lot of the key things that they need at their fingertips uh, will be on an app, free app. Uh, we've begun listening tours. I'll talk more about that in just a little bit. We'll be uh, engaged in those with board members um, throughout this fall and into the, into the spring. Lots of advisory councils are, are underway. We've, we've already begun meeting um, with all uh, many different groups. User voice, which I don't know if you've looked at that lately. We have 14 pages of suggestions um, on the user voice, uh, which is on our front page of our website. For those of you that haven't been to that site yet, you can go on and give us your, your ideas, advice, uh, as we begin thinking about the future of Fairfax County Public Schools. Um, when I said we have 14 pages, you can also vote for any of these suggestions that are already posted. I came across a couple that had one that had 669 votes. Um, I had a, came across another that had 479. So, so people are, are really using it. Uh, so. Uh, I read again through, through all of the suggestions just yesterday, so I think you'll find those interesting. And then we're using a new tool called Set the Record Straight. Um, as there's lots of things going on in the system, and it's hard to cover all the nuances related to all the, all the important work. So in sh to ensure that our, our constituents, our community has accurate information, We'll be using this tool all throughout the, the school year to make sure that all the facts about important work is available to our constituents and to our communities. So I hope that you find all of those steps in the right direction in terms of communicating and, and keeping our community informed um, throughout, throughout the year. Um, on new met ways of measuring learning, um, this is a, a national conversation. I'm, in, I'm excited to see that lots of surrounding jurisdictions are also beginning to get engaged around um, what ways can we better uh, measure teaching and learning beyond SOLs. Um, in fact, I, I anticipate that you'll at some point in their future consider uh, some, a new resolution that's floating uh, throughout the state around uh, imploring our legislature uh, to be, to think differently not just to continue to tweak, but to really think differently and more forward thinking in the area of measuring learning. I think our strategic planning will help us also do that. Uh, as we identify the portrait of a graduate, maybe more portfolio-based assessments, writing for an example, electronic portfolios, measuring writing over time. I think there's a lot of exciting things that we can do there. We are engaged in the PISA pilot. I think that's exciting. We have an opportunity for all of our high schools to participate yes, uh, this year. A lot of valuable information. Our high school principals have found that to be a valuable resource and tool. The national perspective, we're engaged in the large countywide and suburban district consortium, who this is one of their major topics for this year, is to come up with a new strategy for teaching and learning. And then we're participating in some other consortiums as well. And then you have a position statement that you're considering that also addresses that, uh, that you'll be talking about on the 23rd. And then finally, um, I've been very busy talking with folks and visiting and, and hearing um, from a variety of different constituents, their thoughts, dreams, aspirations for our school system. And I'm just beginning. I've got a lot more to learn. Uh, but I have met with every uh, school board member at least once, many of you many more times than that. Uh, I've also spent quality time with every member of our leadership team uh, now on numerous occasions. I've met with uh, over 30 elected uh, officials. Um, I've met with over 31 different advocacy groups and uh, major organizations. That includes all three of our principal organizations I've met with at least once. Um, I've gone on three department tours, and that's been fun, spending entire days with, with different, uh, spending an entire day with Jeff and um, Phyllis, almost, and Susan, 
uh, going and touring all the departments and visiting with their uh, staffs. Um, and then cluster tours, I've started those as well with each of our uh, uh, assistant superintendents, cluster assistant superintendents. And then I've gone on three tours with some of you, and I know we've got some more of those scheduled. And then I've made at least 26 school visits. So um, learning a lot, um, but I will tell you that what I've seen is it's, I'm impressed. We have a world-class system. We have every school I've walked into, I could not be more impressed with the principals, with the leadership team, with the quality of the teachers, how engaged and active uh, students are uh, in learning in their classrooms. Uh, we have lots and lots of exceptional students, and it's, it's really wonderful to have the opportunity to uh, be in a, with a school system where the community is, feels so strongly about its public schools. So things look good. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, we've had a very, very positive start. I thank you for all of your support of our schools as you've gone out and welcomed students and welcomed faculty back. Um, and that concludes my report. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vaza. That was an excellent presentation. Any comments or questions from board members? I have a Ms. Church. And I'm, I'm gonna let you just make your way back, but um, there is one point that uh, as the liaison to ACSD and very passionate about um, that uh, population of our students who are in that special education category, uh, that the achievement gap that we often talk about is often limited to um, a cultural or a racial or even a, um, a poverty driven financial um, uh, gap. But actually when you look at the performance, the biggest gap uh, in terms of achievement are our students with, who are in special education. And it's often um, because of struggle to read, struggle to write, problems with dyslexia, problems with um, communication skills. And I do want to make sure that because that is, um, even though it's a slightly decreased number, that's 13.8% of our population, and, and probably many that aren't actually formally identified, that we address that in terms of the achievement gap and how, how we can best go forward and a lot resources to that and ensure that those, those students as well have an opportunity to improve um, the gap that exists. Mr. McElman. Just a quick question. You alluded to the fact that all of our schools might have the opportunity to pr uh, participate in PISA this year, the 26 high schools. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, we've, uh, we believe we have enough resource and also the, you know, they're willing to, to help us a little bit in order for more of our schools to participate. Uh, we've talked with our high school principals and they want to participate. There's very much interest on their part. Uh, we have a different window though. Uh, last year when it was done, the window was very difficult for our schools. This year, the window uh, that's been established for the, for the testing is much more conducive to our school calendars. So our high school principals are excited about that as well. Um, and we believe that we can really work on our sample sizes. Um, it, that was challenged by the fact that the timing of the testing last time. So we, we anticipate our sample sizes will also be uh, stronger. Mr. Wicker. Dr. Garza, uh, something that you didn't say was you've also met with a number of individuals and uh, what I've observed is you have been just incredibly generous with your time and so thank you. And I also have a, an observation to share with my fellow board members which was I had the opportunity to follow Dr. Garza through Chantilly High School and uh, she's unable to walk into a classroom without talking to the students. I love talking. Mrs. McLaughlin. Uh, I, I first want to echo what uh, my colleague, Mr. Velkoff, had to say. Uh, I am finding with every constituent stakeholder, uh, member of our school community who has come to meet you in these past two months, they are absolutely overwhelmed by your in energy, your enthusiasm, your engagement. And uh, I want to thank you that just even after two months, you have made this board of 12 look darn, darn good <laughs> for, for, for finding such a diamond like you. So thank you for that. Um, I did want to 
just comment that I again know that my colleagues and you and this system continue to be greatly concerned about our achievement gap. And one of the questions I was wondering, not for necessarily tonight, but for us to be thinking about is when we look at the gap um, and how deeply it widened when the tests were changed, um, there really was only a slight bump for our white and Asian students, but a dramatic drop for black and Hispanic students. Has there been an analysis of whether the gap and that tremendous drop happened in other jurisdictions throughout the Commonwealth? And if it's similar throughout the Commonwealth, then I think that we as a board and working with you have a real responsibility to be talking to the Virginia Board of Education because if that pattern exists um, throughout the Commonwealth, then I would say there is a very severe flaw in whatever it was they did with the test that you would see um, our underrepresented populations um, having that dramatic of a drop. So it was one of the things that really captured my attention. I do want to thank you for this report and um, I'm very excited to be um, supporting your efforts, um, especially in this new year. So thank you. Ms. Hines. Thank you. I just quickly wanted to say thank you and thank you to everyone. Um, having been in the classroom for nine years and been through the process of opening school, I know how much work it is and I know that it only happens through a lot of people being absolutely dedicated to what they do and spending a lot of time. So um, I also have really enjoyed so far going around to the schools and seeing people and um, just, just a thank you to everybody out there who's making it happen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next, we have a student representative matters. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, uh, building on what I said earlier, uh, students are getting back to school and we are getting back to into the swing of things. Uh, one, one particular student uh, driven body that is starting back up again next week is the Student Advisory Council, which is composed of four students from the high schools around the county. Um, so we start our monthly meetings next Wednesday and I'm very much looking forward to them being able to sit in and listen to uh, all the schools at once and I'm really excited to use that as a resource this upcoming year. I'd also like to thank uh, everyone who came out and spoke on the uh, TJ Emissions Policy Changes. Uh, I saw three students here uh, and two teachers, and I could have missed a few. Um, and I'll speak more on that matter later. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have action items. Uh, we only have a one action item, which is 3.01, Policy 3355, High School for Science and Technology. And Mrs. Smith for a motion. Thank you, Chairman Moon. I move that the school board adopt policy 3355.4, High School for Science and Technology, as discussed by the school board. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Stork. Mrs. Smith, you want to speak on your motion? Yes. Um, the board's role is to set policy. And when we had our discussion about TJ, um, we decided we went through a, a thoughtful process that, and we took our time to go through the TJ policy. And it is listed in the agenda item, but I want to talk about some of this. We started in the process in October of 2012. Um, the governance committee looked at the policy. Uh, the governance committee wanted to get feedback from the entire board, so we had a discussion with the board to find out their priorities with the policy. After that, the governance committee worked. It took us a few meetings to go through the policy, to um, suggest changes to the entire board. And then we came back to the board at our July uh, 15th work session, talked about it. I have my marked up copy from when we, we had a discussion and went through, came to agreement about what changes we wanted. And at that time, the board said, let's put it on for new business and action. So tonight is the action time. Um, I think that the board wanted to ensure that we created consistency in our wording. We noticed the policy, sometimes it said uh, math first or science first, so we looked for some consistency in that. But it was definitely a focus of the board to be sure that we retained a comprehensive admissions process and we wanted rigorous standards. So a lot of thoughtfulness went into the words and so that our superintendent and staff would have the guidance of, of the student body we want at TJ. Um, we did a lot of work with this. We've heard from the community. I ask for my colleague's support in approving this uh, policy tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Stork. 
Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just like reiterate what uh, Ms. Smith just said, and, and uh, I chaired the committee during most of the work on this, and we had a very lively discussion and debate throughout, um, and those debates and discussions were brought to the board, and I know the board equally was engaged and involved with trying to address where are we going with TJ, what do we want to do, what's our intent. Um, I was on the board uh, previously about five years ago, six years ago, when we did an in-depth review as well at that time, again, trying to find the right mix, the right focus. At that time, something that we did that I think is notable for today is that we, in particular, tried to establish the point and the, the expectation that TJ was, in fact, for folks who were interested in science and technology, engineering, I mean, essentially STEM education. And we did that because we, we weren't as sure before that folks, students who were going to, to uh, TJ understood that that was truly what it was all about. Uh, this time around, it, there really was less discussion about that because I think it's a more expected and more uh, understood part of what that curriculum is. So this time we're trying to, again, further balance, I think, what we truly are looking for in TJ. Uh, we have made, I think, progress and strides with what we have in, in the document today. Um, we know, we, we recognize that there's some additional work that needs to be done. And I appreciate Dr. Garza's comments, not only in conversation with the committee and, and the board as a whole, about the role of policy to regulation. We clearly know that we start with policy. That's really what we're doing here tonight. We understood and understand that there will be other changes that the staff will look at these things and they'll interpret our words and they'll bring out a, a regulation that we hope will, will address those words in a way we, the board feels good, but the board will have an opportunity to further engage Dr. Garza and staff about how those regulations will look and how they'll be implemented going forward. So again, I think this is really the beginning of, of this new process. We clearly have a number of issues to address, not just the quantitative skills of, of students coming in. And I, again, I would define that very broadly, not just math, but there's clearly a variety of quantitative skills. But we also have some severe needs to address in the uh, student representation at TJ. Those don't start at the admissions level to TJ, they clearly start much sooner than that. And we have absolutely our work cut out for us there. And, and I know the board recognizes that. And I know that we need to make some more investments and more efforts in that area to truly have TJ represent what this exceptional, I think, school system represents, which is high functioning, highly focused um, students and wanting to be successful as become successful as adults. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stork. I have about four board members on my list right now, uh, Mr. Strauss, Mr. Anna Koufax, and Ms. Evans, and Mrs. McLaughlin. Before I go to Mrs. Strauss, let me call on Dr. Garza. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to uh, thank you, Mr. Stork, for bringing that up. Yes, it is important um, that the work that this, this board has done on this policy. And um, we are, and I want the member, I know the board knows this, but I want the community to know that we do have a committee that is working on uh, some draft regulation on how we might take these these um, this new policy and actually execute it, uh, and make it make it actionable. I was uh, pleased to hear some of the recommendations from uh, some of the speakers tonight. Actually, will be re reflected. Um, I ex suspect uh, with that work uh, because some of that conversation I'm well aware of in terms of making sure that we have some of our highest achieving math students, making sure that the a holistic scoring approach, which I think is a great, um, you know, it's the best practice. But we also are challenged with making sure that we have students have equal opportunity to be well prepared for success and have the opportunity to get into TJ. Um, we also are looking at new assessment instruments to make sure that we have a very rigorous uh, assessment instrument that will, and we have a broad section of individuals who are helping us do that, including the principal at TJ. So I expect some really good uh, sound uh, recommendations for regulations from that committee. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Uh, let me call on Mr. Strauss to be followed by Mr. Narcofax. Thank you, yes, I very much support um, the, the, the proposed changes that we've worked on for this policy. And Dr. Garza, thank you for the work with the committee because it, 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 it is important that we get everybody's feedback and input. We've worked for years on the wonderful curriculum that is offered at Thomas Jefferson. It is a particular school with a particular focus and we want to make sure that the young people who attend Thomas Jefferson are prepared and ready to engage in the in the specialized program that is there. 
Um, and again, as some of the speakers have said tonight, it is in, incumbent on us that we prepare children for, for those who are potentially the, the deep thinkers and that will uh, excel in the STEM fields and, yes, be good mathematicians. Make sure that the children who come to us in kindergarten or Head Start or wherever they come to us, that they are given the opportunity and the recognition and the push so that by the time they are in middle school, um, their skills are developed to the point where they will be ready to, um, to show what they can do with this admissions policy. So I think that the, the changes that we've made, I think, will help um, the committee to come up with the actual uh, admissions procedure to make sure that we are, in fact, um, inviting the children who will most benefit from the wonderful program that is at the school. So I very much appreciate all the work that I know that we've done on this, as well as the input from everybody else. So I do support the changes. Thanks. Um, Mr. Nakofex. Thank you. Um, I just want to say I appreciate everyone's comments, their candor and passion who came out to talk a lot about this tonight. Um, we really do hear you and we listen to you. And as Dr. Garza said, as the dialogue continues, we will um, be be making, continue to make changes and improvements to this. Um, as Ms. Smith and Mr. Stork talked, um, the changes that we brought, they're brought before us tonight are ones that have been well thought out. Um, they've been represented, um, you know, in dialogue with the full board, with the governance committee, and they've also reflected comments provided to us by the AAP community at large. So I will be, of course, supporting the language as written, but I do look forward to continued conversations on this topic to keep TJ the number one STEM um, school in the country. I have a Ms. Evans to be followed by Mrs. McLaughlin and Ms. Hines, Mrs. Reed, and Ms. Schultz. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank all the community members who came out to talk to us about um, this policy. Um, I, I appreciate uh, both the, the comments as well as the emails we've received on this. Um, it's good to see everyone paying attention to this. Uh, this is a, a modest but positive change in our policy, and um, we do have larger issues, as, as others have referred to. We have larger issues to deal with, in particular, um, making sure that we have uh, more true diversity at this school, as well as making sure that the students who attend Thomas Jefferson also do have the math skills that they need to flourish at that school. So I am very pleased that this um, that we are making these changes, but also that Dr. Garza is focusing on this issue, and I will look forward to, to those recommendations. It sounds like you're well on your way. Thank you. Ms. Mrs. McLaughlin. As um, a member of the governance committee that worked very carefully on this policy, and as a former college admissions officer, I wanted to share with the community that um, I had been very concerned with the existing policy we had in place, as well as the admissions practices. Um, I have deeply appreciated the courage and the commitment and the energy that the TJ faculty and its principal put forth in bringing this issue to the school board and to being able to truly speak to the impact that it was having on our ability to have TJ remain one of the best magnet STEM high schools in the United States. I also want to thank the parents and the students, um, not just this evening, but throughout when the faculty came forward and spoke parents and students also came and shared their direct experiences and observations about the importance of us looking at this policy and really trying to ensure that we communicated both to the school system as well as to the public on what we want for this school to become. So I do want to say that uh, there was discussion about whether this policy should be as sparse as it is, and it is rather sparse. Um, but as, again, a member of the Governance Committee, I want to again extend my appreciation to Dr. Garza because she attended those meetings and through her substantive and thoughtful assurances to our Governance Committee that she recognized what the community was telling us and that she shared our desire to improve um, the regulations that relate to TJ and the admissions practices that come from that. I am very comfortable uh, with the proposed changes to the policy at this time. Uh, I 
am so appreciative that we have a superintendent who is leading this effort to say continuous improvement means we can always um, do better than what we've done. So this is an indictment on anything that's been there before, but what it's saying is when we listen to the community and we can identify ways to do things better, that's a position of strength and it's also, I think, a, a, a reflection of what we want to be teaching our own children, which is that there's always room for improvement and let's embrace that. So I want to thank uh, my colleagues who've spoken to date about their support for this policy. And uh, again, uh, I cannot thank enough the TJ faculty who have spoken so powerfully about the needs of um, looking at this policy and making positive change. Ms. Hines to be followed by Mrs. Reed and Ms. Schurz and Mr. Ash. Thank you. Um, I, I will support this change. Um, I feel confident having uh, watched what's happened so far and listening to Dr. Garza just now that um, the regulations that will implement this will be done in a way that does address the concerns of the TJ faculty. And um, I, that's obviously something that we need to do. The, the second question here though, and other people have mentioned it, I'm very uh, grateful that the COTS representatives were here tonight to talk to it. Um, I think anytime we look at TJ admissions, we absolutely have to look at the, uh, the diversity problem, and it's a problem. Um, and if, if the uh, implementation of this policy also makes what we do more equitable and transparent and less vulnerable to um, the effect of family resources, um, then we will have also, I think, made some important steps there. But of course, as everybody, as people have said, it, it doesn't start with TJ admissions, it starts a lot younger. And um, I've never been particularly fond of the way we do advanced academics um, in this county. And uh, one of the reasons is that I think, um, and we do have to be a little bit careful how we talk about this, but I think that if you look at the numbers, uh, we are segregating. And I know we don't do that on purpose, but when you look at the numbers, that's what's happening. And it's starting in third grade. And uh, so I think, um, th I'm, again, I'm glad that Koss was here tonight to talk about that. Um, and I, I think it has to be uh, one of our goals um, as a school board right now to ensure that those pipelines to TJ are not um, avenues of unfairness. So. Mrs. Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I very much support this policy. Um, I've been on governance um, for a couple of years now, and so we have worked diligently and discussed this in great detail. And at one time, I think one of our drafts was probably about three times as long because we were jumping into the operational details. And soon we learned that uh, we needed to be back in the policy world, and we needed to make sure that we used specific language in order to give the superintendent um, adequate direction, but then to let her and her staff do their jobs. So um, I feel that we have attained that goal. I feel very good about it. I feel that with this policy, we have given her direction so that we'll have the right students in the school that will uh, be addressing some of those issues that were raised by teachers and administrators and families. Um, and I, I feel that also this could give us an opportunity to really look for those diamonds in the rough, people who have the potential to be deep creative thinkers, who can help us solve real world problems, who can be creative, who can communicate. But maybe, as my colleague Ms. Hines just said, maybe don't, don't come from the same background as someone else. And so I'm hoping that you can come up with a way to try to find the potential in people. And, and TJ may be one answer, but the other thing I learned by talking to the AAP advisory committee the other day is they said to me, well, why are we only emphasizing TJ as the only answer? You know, if you're not in TJ, well, then there's no other options. And so part of my learning process, I think, is, is understanding, okay, this is one avenue for people, but what about everyone who applies who doesn't get in? or who isn't interested in applying, you know, what are we doing to encourage those kids just as much to, uh, to enter the STEM fields and to reach their potential, uh, as well as the underrepresented communities. So I think this policy uh, does what it's supposed to do, but as my colleagues have alluded, we have now raised many other issues and questions 
that we need to address uh, with staff and the superintendent to begin to really wrestle to the ground many of these other issues that are related. But I certainly feel that this is, is much tighter. It's more concise. It gives you the direction that you need, Dr. Garza. And I also want to thank, along with Ms. McLaughlin, um, all the, the staff, uh, the FCAG members, Dr. Glazer, the PAC folks, everybody, the parents who've really been working here. It's been about a year, I believe. Uh, and many of them, I, I think, were so frustrated and thought this would never happen. And maybe these are little word changes to some people. But I tell you, I feel that these are significant changes, that we are on the right track now, and we're, we're going to pass the baton over to Dr. Garza, and I feel very good about that, so thank you. Okay, Mr. Short, to be followed by Mr. Ash. I'm trying to abbreviate, because I, we're doing one of these, our well-known, if one and two and four and five speak, then the rest of us feel like we need to speak. Um, but I, I think in terms of hearing from my colleagues, this is, it's very interesting um, when we do all speak because you get little nuggets. And Ms. Evans said tonight that this was a modest but positive change. And I think that that's the key behind this because um, it's far from enough of a change. It's far from addressing everything that needs to be addressed with the TJ admissions process. Um, I do think that there is some conflict um, even on this board, certainly within the staff, and, um, and maybe even in the community, as we heard from our speakers tonight, about the purpose of TJ. What is the inherent purpose of TJ as a magnet school? Is our role as um, elected leaders for Fairfax County to run this school system to have a diverse uh, community and well-rounded students coming out of TJ? Or is it to have compelling students who are going to be the future industry leaders in the STEM fields, who are gonna be running um, major endeavors in the math and sciences? And I don't think that this board has achieved a resolution on self-reflection, and that self-reflection comes from the community that we're elected to represent. So if there are opinions on this, we need to hear it because we, we are not here to operate independently of our own mindset. We're here to elect, to be elected and to represent the 1.1 million residents in Fairfax County and the two and a half billion dollars, the 68% of the county's budget, or 54% of the county's budget, I apologize. Um, so that's a substantial amount of money that goes toward the education of all of our students. But I do think that there has to be some inherent acknowledgement that TJ was created for a purpose and whether or not we're gonna remain true to that purpose. I do think that this is a modest and positive change, um, as my colleague Ms. Evans said. Um, but I do think that there is much work to be done, and a lot of it is going to have to do with an assessment of what the future of TJ is and what the real purpose of that school is going forward. Thank you. Mr. Ash. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I must qualify these uh, comments by saying that though I normally try to remain impartial as an FCPS student, uh, I see it as impractical uh, and see it as serving no use um, to remain impractical in this issue. So tonight I speak uh, my own opinions as a TJ student. Um, so ev uh, the other board members have described um, the broad significance of these changes, but I'd like to actually uh, just explore a few of them. Um, the first is the use of the word exceptional in regards to quantitative skills. Um, we may not be able to fill a class uh, with exceptional math students, but we can try. And of all the mathematical, of all the scientific geniuses that I've learned about, I can only think of one um, who didn't have particularly strong math skills and still achieved something great in science. Uh, on the word rigorous, uh, as in rigorous standards in the admissions process, I hope this leads to a tougher math section um, and a clear analysis that yes, these students do have what it takes to uh, keep up 
with the math classes. Uh, I was a particular, um, particular advocate for the word passion because TJ is geared towards uh, people with an innate desire to go into STEM. And so if they don't have that passion, if they don't have that drive that's willing to make them not just uh, do the requisite workload, but go, uh, go on, try to get ahead or try to explore more concepts or uh, work outside the parameters somehow in their own interest. If they don't have that desire, then I don't believe they will truly succeed at TJ. They might get by, they might even get all A's, but that's not what TJ is about. Uh, finally, the word holistic. Uh, finding this passion um, in, by reading essays and reading short answers is difficult. Um, and we need to find a process that can really look at a whole, uh, a whole person and say, this student has it, this student has that drive. Um, in summary, kids at TJ only truly succeed if they want to be there and want to learn. And that's, I believe these changes are really geared towards that and that's why I support this policy change. Thank you. Okay, with that, not seeing any more hand. Let me call for the vote. The motion on the table is to adopt the policy 3355.4, High School for Science and Technology, as discussed by the school board. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. The vote is unanimous. The motion passes. Now let me see whether we can see the screen. Yeah, Madam Clerk promised about five, six seconds. Technical glitch. Very good. Okay, so that took 20 minutes, 20 seconds. Okay, thank you. Okay, next order of business is consent agenda. Our adopted rules of parliamentary procedure, Robert's rules, provide for a consent agenda, listing several items for approval of the board by a single motion. Most of the, of the items listed under the consent agenda have gone through board committee review and recommendation. Documentation concerning these items has been provided to all board members and public in advance to assure an extensive and thorough review Items may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of any board member prior to the meeting. 4.01, approve the minutes of June 10 and July 9, 2013 operational expectations work sessions, the July 25, 2013 regular school board meeting and September 4, 2013 special meeting regarding contractual matters. 4.02, adopt policy 8 1802, student representatives to the school board, policy 2301, psychological testing, screening, student evaluation, and placement, policy 2245, home instruction by parents and part-time enrollment of homeschooled students, policy 4130, state licensure requirements, educational personnel, policy 4415, hygiene practices, uh, policy 4440, performance assessments and evaluations, and policy 4450, communication between the school board and its employees as detailed in the agenda item. 4.03, appoint members to the Family Life Education Curriculum Advisory Committee as detailed in the agenda item. 4.04, award the contract for the children replacements at Robinson Secondary School to the lowest responsible and responsible bidder 
EDW Car Crane and Company Incorporated in the amount of $729,000 and authorized the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 4.05, appoint individuals to serve on committees as detailed in the agenda item. Is there any objection to approving the consent agenda? Hearing and seeing no objection, the consent agenda is approved. Next, we have new business. The following are new business agenda items. There will not be a vote tonight on these items, but action is scheduled at a future meeting. 5.01, appoint individuals to serve a one a one-year term on the challenged material interdepartmental review committee as detailed in the agenda item. 5.02, award the contract for the automatic temperature control system replacement at Franklin Middle School to the lowest responsible responsible bidder and authorize the division superintendent or assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 5.03, Award a contract for the automatic temperature control system replacement at Wayne Og Elementary School to the lowest responsible responsible bidder and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. Next, we have a superintendent matters, Dr. Garza. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to congratulate everyone involved uh, with the um, um, Statesman Station and the ribbon cutting this morning. I thought it was wonderful. Uh, I was so impressed um, with the turnout and how many people were interested and supportive of that endeavor. I want to thank board members for your support of that effort. Um, some of you particularly were championing that and great work. I was very impressed. I also want to congratulate Susan Quinn, Penny McConnell, and the staff. The food was wonderful. Uh, the students are great. And Jay Pearson, my goodness, what a great principal. And of course, his leadership in that effort was most impressive. Um, we've been notified that Glasgow Middle School uh, has been selected as an AVID demonstration site. It's a very difficult process to, to be uh, named a demonstration site. So congratulations to Glasgow Middle School. Uh, and again, I want to just thank all of our principals and staff for a great, great start to the, to the school year. And then finally, uh, I don't know if Mary Beth is here. Is Mary Beth Glass here? There she is. Um, we want to congratulate uh, her and her staff. Uh, we've been named the winner of the 2013 Governor's Technology Award for the innovative use of technology in education for our Bring Your Own Device initiative. So congratulations to Mary Beth and her team. Good work. And that concludes my comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Next, we have reports. Uh, I think all the reports will come from Mrs. Kathy Smith. You've been busy. I, I would tell you that a, a subset of this board has been working diligently on the behalf of all of us, especially in the month of August when we're supposedly off. Um, so I'm going to start with the Infrastructure uh, Financing Committee, which is a joint committee with the Board of Supervisors. Um, three members from our board and three members of the Board of Supervisors are meeting. When we first started that committee, it was supposed to meet every other month, but we decided we were going to meet every month because we do have a goal of meeting resources for our facilities. There's a web page on the Board of Supervisors site where you, all of our reports are there. The ones from yesterday's meeting are already posted. And um, the August 7th, we talked about our CIP program. Our staff did an outstanding presentation, really um, explained our CIP program, compared us to nationally and regionally, how much space we use, our costs for renovations. Uh, it's a great presentation you should look at. And um, we also heard about the Fairfax County Pay Down Program, their Pay As You Go program. The meeting we had uh, yesterday, we had a review of the county infrastructure maintenance. They do things differently than we do. Um, we had their facilities, I think it's facilities, um, management department or maintenance, you know, they have their acronyms just like we do and I don't know them all. Uh, the parks, housing and community development, public works, and I can't read my handwriting. Oh, environmental services and human services. So we had reports from all those committees, those are posted. Um, 
I, I really urge my colleagues to look at the information we're getting and, and you know, get back to us if you, if you have any questions because we're working on all of our behalf for the facilities that we need for our kids. Um, the other committee that met twice is the ad hoc committee that you put together at the retreat for superintendent evaluation. We met twice. We um, are working to understand the state requirements so we know what's required of us and what is not. We looked at the state information. Dr. Garza shared what her evaluation system in Lubbock. We looked at what um, Hazard Young and Atiyah suggested. And since our work is to come to the board at the September 23rd work session, we're going to have a recommendation there. And um, we'll be updating you about that then. The other committee that met is the governance committee. And um, we looked at policies. Um, and some of them we're gonna have some more work on. Uh, we are going to bring up the employee organization privileges that will be being listed for a vote at the next meeting. Uh, a little bit of work we did on the instructional program where we looked at a change in measures. There was a request from the board to look at getting information on hours of sleep for school night. So that will be in um, the learning environment operational expectation next year and was, uh, it, bah, information about restorative justice and which schools get changed. And that was our two hour meeting. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Mrs. Smith. Uh, next, we have a board matter. I'll start with uh, Mrs. Rouse. I would like to personally thank Linda Farbury and the Transportation Department. I don't know that people quite understand the tremendous job of getting our children safely to school and back and the tremendous amount of correction that goes on in the first day or two as we tighten things up. But um, I've been extremely pleased and um, I, I know Jeff is there, but very quickly if there was an issue, um, they were responded to often within minutes, maybe an hour at most. So I, Jeff, please pass that along to Ms. Farber. I'm very, very grateful. Because that's a huge worry for parents. Um, so other than that, I'm, I, I've visited almost all of my schools and um, I'm very grateful. They're doing a great job. Lots of wonderful, excited young teachers that get younger every year. It's, isn't that I get older, it's just mm -hmm. get younger. And engaged children. And one of the things that I have so enjoy this year. I have some of the neediest schools in the county where we have children that come with amazing stories of coming here locked in trucks, walking long distances across arid parts of the country. And then I have other children who come with tremendous advantages and so well prepared. But it gives you a very good picture of the job that we have to help every single one of these children. So thank you to all of my schools, my educators. They dearly love every single one of these children, regardless of the difficulty and the challenges or the giftedness that these children come to school with. They are all, all of these teachers are so excited to work with these kids. So it's been a good opening. Thank you. Ms. Evans. Yes, well, first of all, I want to congratulate everybody on this uh, successful start of a school year. Um, I also have been going out to my schools and talking with uh, principals and teachers and parents, so I've been enjoyed that process. And um, even though it was summertime, uh, since the last time that we, we met here, things have been going on, and I do want to congratulate in particular the Annandale High School Pyramid. Uh, they put on the first... Um, Annandale Pyramid Back to School Fair. It was very successful. Um, nearly 3,000 individuals came to that fair. Um, there were free haircuts given, um, backpacks, school supplies, um, a lot of information from the, the schools throughout the pyramid. Um, $3,000 worth of donations, and I, I just want to say that you the- You mean 300,000? Um, 300,000, what did 300. I say? Oh, no, that was 3,000 people and 300,000 donations. Thank you, Mr. Moon. Um, so I do want to um, say thank you to everyone who participated in that. It took a tremendous amount of effort on the part of school administrators, teachers, social workers, volunteers, uh, parents, um, Fairfax County employees, uh, community members, business partners. So um, well done, everyone. And I look forward to participating in the, the next, um, the second annual back to school fair. 
Um, secondly, uh, congratulations to Falls Church High School on their ribbon cutting. I, I'm afraid I was out of town. I wasn't able to attend, but I, I did send my congratulations. And, and uh, particularly thank you to uh, Jeff Plattenberg and facility staff for um, making that happen. Uh, that was, uh, you did a wonderful job over the summer in uh, getting that in place. Um, the ribbon cutting today, I was able to participate as well at Marshall High School. And, um, the uh, marvelous food and uh, congratulations to the Food and Nutrition Services, um, to the, the Marshall High School administrators and everybody who participated in that. And of, of course, Real Food for Kids as well for promoting the um, healthy choices. I, I hope we can expand that pilot uh, in the near future. Um, and uh, last but not least, I just want to say that um, I am trying to get to as many back to school nights as I can and look forward to seeing all the, the parents and teachers and students there. Thanks. Mr. Short? Um, I think that all of us are probably going to say that we're enjoying making the rounds to our schools. Um, I, I, in particular, want to um, congratulate Robinson on an exceptional back to school night and welcoming. Um, the students from the Fairfax um, Island, Fairfax Station Island. I know that's been a difficult transition. Um, in particular, I want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Plattenberg, who has a uh, tremendous uh, opportunity in running. I believe the one point we did not make is that we do have the largest school bus fleet in the country, do we not? Yeah, so uh, apparently we're gonna overtake Greyhound. Um, yep by the year 2017 or something like that. Um, there are significant challenges with those, um, with transportation, um, not only for Robinson, but uh, other schools. The hope is that both for the challenges within a neighborhood, um, with schools that have uh, traffic um, on kiss and ride lines or, or buses as parents settle into th their routine, that that does improve. I know that um, certain of my civic associations have had some difficulty um, with, with traffic and with the settling in of the back to school um, patterns, but have faith um, with a school system this size. Um, the hope is that within the next uh, two weeks or so that we're gonna see some normalcy um, arrive there. I have, um, in the Springfield District, um, I have one or two schools that have arrived back to some unique challenges this, uh, this year. Uh, I do want to welcome Dr. Angela Atwood, uh, Atwater uh, as our new cluster assistant superintendent. And I, I just want to convey to those certain school communities that the team of Dr. Karen Garza and Dr. Atwater and the rest of the SCPS staff, along with myself, are here for you. Uh, we are responding to individual emails and um, community emails. So please know that there is a tremendous amount of support for you, and we will continue to provide that as we level out your particular situations. Um, I do have one comment um, with regard to something that's just appeared in the post. Um, when you look at the, the growth patterns that were presented tonight in our um, terrific report on back to schools, and you realize that we're adding um, the, the number of students that we're adding, and I'm looking at you know, 16 and a half thousand students added in like the last six or seven years. You know, that's larger than most school systems in the entire country. Every year we're adding. Um, entire new school system to, to our um, division. And there are some substantial challenges that have to be met, but it is never a noble government pursuit, um, in my opinion, to go after personal property of either business owners or personal property of homeowners. And I, I wanna caution the residents of Fairfax County very carefully to pay attention and give us feedback before we start talking about eminent domain and seizing things because of poor proper planning from the past. Um, the students are coming and we have to educate them, but I want us to be very careful before we start crossing the line and becoming a liberty taking uh, body at the time that we're trying to educate your students. 
um, that's a very dangerous place for us to tread. And I'm, I'm chagrined to be a part of something that we're considering doing in order to solve this problem. But our colleagues on the Board of Supervisors have got to pay attention. Our residents have to pay attention. And um, those students have to be educated. You don't want 30 or 40 or 50 students per class. You don't want it. And we have to get to a win-win and we have to negotiate in good faith for property, for buildings, for construction, and many different things because the alternative is taking. And that's a very dangerous place. So I hope we don't have to go there. Mr. Vacavian, I hope that we don't discuss any, any facility issues during the board matter. And Mr. McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do want to just reiterate all the um, thank yous for, for all of you coming out to the Marshall Ribbon Cutting today. It's rare that we get uh, eight board members in one place, and I think that's a true testament to our, um, uh, our uh, excitement <laughs> over, over, the, um <laughs> over the work we're doing around food. And um, I do want to just let my colleague Kathy Smith know that any any jokes that were made today were solely in jest and same with the chairman I do not think you eat too much but um, I, I eat a lot <laughs> but in, in all seriousness the, the the Marshall pilot truly is um, a tangible representation of the great work we can do as a board and I know pa for Pat and I that's been a labor of love and I was sorry you couldn't be there today but we, we, we did miss you um, so we'll, we'll continue monitoring it and see how we can expand it thank you Mr. Smith? Ms. Nana Kofax? Thank you. Um, I do want to say, as many of my colleagues have, I've really enjoyed the back to school nights. They are always energizing and fun, and you see the excitement of some of the parents who bring their children, and it's wonderful, and the parents are all excited. It's just a as the new school year it brings, you know, the promise of future success. So it's it's always exciting as we open up. Um, I also do want to echo my comments to Jeff. Plat uh, my colleagues have said about Jeff Plattenberg and his staff. Um, I know we've had a few hiccups with uh, transportation issues, and they were solved very, very quickly. And I know um, now that I know we we're as big as Greyhound, I can appreciate it even more. So thank you so much. Um, I also do want to echo Ryan's comments about uh, Statesman Station today. How. It is um, one of those things. It was an idea that we worked together as a board and community, and we came together and have a wonderful pilot program with wonderful um, new, fresh options for our students, which we hope then we can roll out to other schools, and that's very, very important. And I do want to thank Dr. Garza for these uh, for first two months for the level of energy and enthusiasm that you've brought. I really appreciate it. And I just want to share with you, um, you know, she said, oh, I made a few little, you know, stops, w did some districts. Um, Dr. Garza and I could have driven to the beach for the amount of time she spent, <laughs> spent in my car one day. We visited all 22 schools in Lee District, plus some in Mr. Stork's district. So we were in the car three hours, and we didn't choose to ride to the beach, and we weren't even bored. We had a wonderful conversation, talked about each school, and so that's her level of commitment. So I want you all to know that it, it wasn't just a little visit. It, it was quite a lengthy one, so thank you, and I, and I look forward to spending more time with you. And also, I just want to um, remind everyone that the education is coming up September 28th. We'll have more time to discuss this at the next meeting, but there's, there's information online and it will be held at Edison High School this year so I encourage all parents um, citizens anybody who wants to learn about the school system to come to this excellent event thank you Mrs. Uh, I first want to give a shout out to Pine Spring Elementary and principal Armando Perry um, he invited me to join them on their first day of school opening and this was my first time as a school board member ever going to the actual first day of school where I wasn't a parent. And uh, it was really magical to see the excitement of those young students, K through six. Uh, it, all I could think about was if we could capture and bottle that excitement and that enthusiasm that those kids showed on that day and help our somewhat tired and stressed out middle schooler and high school students 
uh, imagine um, you know the the enthusiasm and the energy um, that w that would carry on um, in the classroom it really it was adorable to see those kids um, I I've uh, been also appreciative to the schools in Bragg District who've invited me to their back to school nights. Um, I have truly enjoyed being a part of that um, and seeing so many of our families coming out and being a key piece of um, academic success for our students and uh, our principals and our teachers are doing an outstanding job of creating a very warm and welcoming um, event for our families to feel that they really are a part of, of that. Um, I also wanted to share with my colleagues that um, this past Sunday I was invited by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, which is a national organization and has a, a, a local chapter here in uh, Fairfax. Um, this past Sunday, it's their annual walk of Out of the Darkness, and it is about raising awareness and hoping, preventing, and reducing suicides in our, in our country and in our communities. And over 500 participants came out um, to participate in the walk and over $65,000 were raised um, and continue to be raised um, just by this chapter alone. Uh, I was one of four speakers um, that day along with um, Delegate Krupika and um, a professor um, who specializes in mental health and also Congressman Conley's office, um, Smitty Conley was also there speaking. Um, what touched me the most was that there were several Fairfax County families um, and um, even teachers who were there, um, there for the walk to honor the lives we've lost and to try to, again, um, reduce this from happening in our communities. And uh, I will um, provide more information to my colleagues about this because um, this is an organization that um, has really deeply appreciated Dr. Dockery and her team um, for meeting with them and starting the dialogue on how we can continue to strengthen and improve our education and awareness, um, not just on suicide prevention for our, our students um, and for our, our employees, but also uh, being able to focus on the whole child and, again, the critical aspects of, of mental health awareness because if we can capture these students early, we can save lives. And uh, so I'm, I'm excited about that and I really deeply appreciate Dr. Dockery, again, reflecting the best of FCPS, which is being responsive to our outside stakeholders who can bring um, additional information, help us be a stronger school system. And uh, finally, I do want to echo the shout outs to um, Jeff Plattenberg and his team. Um, two of my high schools in Bragg District, both Woodson and Lake Braddock, uh, received um, their new uh, synthetic turf fields um, in uh, this summer. Um, and in Woodson's case, they literally were finished um, uh, 48 hours before game day so that their first home game uh, was able to be played at Woodson. And for those seniors especially, when you only have five home games before your high school career ends, it was really meaningful. And I want to thank Jeff again publicly so much because I know how much that meant to our families um, and it was a, a, truly a sausage factory behind the scenes trying to sort through some of it and, and Jeff you did an outstanding job and you kept your cool the whole time so my, my personal appreciation for that. Thanks everybody. Besides. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, I'm very sorry to have missed the state's new station opening today, and I, I forgot to ask somebody to make me a plate, so I'm assuming that didn't happen, but um, I'll have to go back and, and get lunch there one day. It looks beautiful. Um, uh, thanks to Food Nutrition Services, Marshall High School, Real Food for Kids, and uh, my partner Ryan um, for all the work that you did on it. Um, Back to school nights quickly. I was at Thoreau briefly tonight, Thoreau Middle School. Everything is uh, everything came out very smoothly and beautifully. They're about to head into a huge renovation project, so um, wish them luck on that. It will be beautiful when they're done. Out at Forest Edge last night, uh, which again, sort of as Ms. Strauss was saying, Forest Edge community is, is a reflection of all the great diversity and, and just the, the wonder of this um, county, so it was really nice to be there. Um, I will be out at some more next week. I'm very sorry that I won't be able to be at every one, but it's not possible. They are stacked up on some nights. Um, the end of October, I am very much looking forward to uh, being on the listening tour with Superintendent Garza out in Hunter Mill. 
Um, we're just setting the date and the location right now, um, but as soon as I have that, I'll be sure to shoot that out to everybody in Hunter Mill. Um, and thank you so much for uh, being willing to do that. It's going to be fun. Um, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was out in Reston, Reston Interfaith, which is now called Cornerstones. They've changed their name, but it's a great organization. I always say, if you're in Reston and you see somebody doing something that needs to be done, it's probably Reston Interfaith, so it's probably Cornerstones now. Um, had a wonderful event at Stone in the Stonegate community. Dr. Zuluaga, the um, Cluster Assistant Superintendent for Cluster 8 was there, Emily Cope, Principal at Hunters Woods, and Terry Dade, the new principal at Dogwood Elementary were out there as well. We met with some parents and um, it was just a, a great opportunity to sort of push into the community where people live to make sure that they were able to ask questions and uh, get to know their local education leaders. Um, it was a great evening. And finally, um, Mr. Plattenberg, uh, you have an email coming from me on transportation. I'll just lay it as one bus issue. But I have to say, I mean, given the complexity of, of this system, I think people really, it is amazing um, that we had such a smooth start. Uh, it's, really, it's really wonderful. So thank you so much, everybody. Mrs. Reed. Some of this we can't help but repeat ourselves, I guess. but. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Plattenberg, for helping get all the turf fields ready. Uh, in my case, it was Falls Church. I uh, represented the board there at that and spoke to the crowd. It was very, very exciting for them. Um, the ribbon cutting at Oakton High School, there were four of us there at that, um, and that was equally as exciting. Um, the game wasn't nearly as good as the ribbon cutting, though. <laughs> Never is. And of course, uh, the Marshall High School, and we, we've talked about the Statesman Station, and, and I think we've talked about the staff and the Real Food for Kids, but the real stars of the show were MC Horn and the Fresh Rappers today, uh, the kids who came up with this very clever rap song about nutrition and how cool it is, and, and the teacher was there, and they, it was just very, very exciting, so I hope somebody captured that on film. As I said, it really captures this whole idea of the four C's, you know, that they were involved in the beginning and really, you know, they did the marketing and they did the awning and just the whole thing it was great. I hope we can do more of that. Um, also, I uh, participated in the groundbreaking at the Providence Community Center. I bet you didn't even know that we were building one. Um, it's by the Metro West. Um, and those lucky folks who, who will be able to walk from Metro West to Oakton, if you remember the boundary study issue a while back. Anyway, um, they are planning to, um, to be done in 2015, and they do plan to have after-school activities there. So um, that'll be real nice for the families that live in that area. I attended the Freedom Hill Back to School Night last night, and those are all exciting. I think we all agree we love being back in the schools, but what, what I learned something, and that is that they have taken their computer lab and turned it into a STEM lab, and now all the classes are using it, and it's really more of, you know, hands-on technology and kind of, it's more of this multimedia uh, across the different subject areas. It was very interesting what they're doing over there. I had no idea. So I'd love to uh, take a little field trip over there sometime and, and learn more about that. Um, and last but not least, uh, Mrs. Smith, uh, a couple of us over here have been working on a committee also called the Budget Committee, but I will let my colleague talk about what we've been doing there. Mr. Michael? Yes, I'm going to use my time to speak briefly about the budget. And to make sure I have your attention, uh, we have a deficit of $159 million. So um, we should all be aware that at the uh, work session on September 23rd, we are going to provide some guidance to the superintendent in terms of what we value. There's going to be some homework. It will come out next week. And it will be um, a list of values. And backing up the values will be some examples of what those values translate to into programs. So please come prepared because on the 23rd, we are going to prioritize um, those values that we're going to be sending out. And the superintendent will be using this as guidance. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, please contact uh, me or Mrs. Reed. Um, also, I believe all of you are, are aware that uh, we have individual meetings scheduled for each of you to meet with the superintendent and the chief financial officer. And these meetings are an opportunity for 
each of us to have questions answered. If you have cer certain questions that are gonna require some research, please send them in advance and so that the answers can be ready and we're not putting um, Mrs. Quinn or Mrs. Michael on, on the spot on those things. Um, but it's a, so it's a, an opportunity for you to have questions answered and it's an opportunity for you to express your opinion about some of the choices that may be made this year. Um, and the last thing I just wanna say is, um, I, I, I think that's a good example of um, the level of commitment to transparency and communication about the budget. And I believe that the, the new superintendent, the financial officer, is completely committed to a transparent process and um, making sure that everything we do is credible. Um, so again, I encourage you to bring your opinions and your questions to those meetings. Mr. Stork. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to thank Dr. Garza to start for um, being in Washington Mill Elementary School for back to this school. Um, well, actually not for the first day of school and, and meeting with um, Brian Bennett, who's also a new principal there. He's just uh, been there a few months and uh, he uh, was off to a very enthusiastic start. I think uh, we would both agree and the kids clearly were as well. So again, thank you, Dr. Garza for your attendance there. Uh, back to school nights, I obviously has been said by many of you, can't go to all of them, but I do love to go to them and I try to go to as many as I can and, and have, have, have had the opportunity to, to go to Laurel Hill Elementary School and meet with Susie Montgomery, the principal there and, and the kindergarten classes and meet with some of the parents as part of that. Uh, Waynewood Elementary School is also one of the larger elementary schools and a very active elementary school. They always have a major assembly with of at least six or 700 parents there. So it's uh, one of those kind of events and, and, uh, and Jamie Meyer always does an excellent job of working with the, the staff and, and the principals, excuse me, the parents to, to make sure they're ready. Uh, a couple more that I wanted to mention, um, particularly was at Hayfield uh, Middle School and, and Ms. Jenna Koufax, I, I know that you're gonna wanna borrow uh, Dave Tremaine's uh, suit. He has an orange suit to go with the, the orange color at Hayfield and since your son is now at Syracuse, I'm assuming you're gonna be probably grabbing that from him at least to go to the football games or something, I don't know. but. And then uh, for 9-11, also that same day, we, I went to Fort Belvoir Elementary School and, and they had a, a special event at the, uh, at the post, but also at the school, they had a back to school night, uh, one of a couple that they hold. So, but the, it's a new school with a new principal, um, particularly pleased with, with the, how Teresa Carhart is getting started. It's a big school and, and a lot of changes there and, and she's off to a great start with uh, both parents and teachers. And so lots of good things happening there. And then uh, tonight, I uh, had an opportunity to go to, uh, to Saratoga Elementary School, something I, I've been doing for many years. And uh, Pat Conklin is the principal there. And we both had, we, we probably could almost hear us here at the board. Uh, we were squealing with delight. Um, this is a school where many of you are familiar with this. We've had uh, no doors on the classrooms for most of the time that the school has been there. And I kind of made a pledge when I got on this board 10 years ago that one way or the other, I was going to get doors because frankly, as somebody who, is, who needs to have quiet when I'm focused and, and the extra noise really makes it difficult, I appreciated the challenges that the students and teachers had in those classrooms. Well, the good news is they have doors now in all their, on all their classrooms. And the other good news is that the musty old and sometimes moldy carpet that is at least in uh, the first floor of the school is now gone new tile, new walls painted. It looks like a brand new school. So I, I know that it's, it's on the list, uh, Mr. Plattenberg, and I appreciate everything that's being done. And, and I'm glad that we are taking this opportunity to try to really to fix something that we know has been a long-term issue. And I know I have a couple more that are still, you're still working on, but again, appreciate everything that's been done to get this school ready. And, and uh, thank you all. Okay, with that, the board will now make a motion to go into a closed meeting. One to discuss and consider disciplinary matters concerning students pursuant to section 2.23711A2 of the Code of Virginia. Two, to consult with the legal counsel and receive a legal advice regarding participation in probable litigation filed by another school division pursuant to 2.23711A7 of the Code of Virginia. Three, A, 
to discuss and consider agreements with the other jurisdictions where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the school board, and B, to consult with the legal counsel and receive advice on the same topic pursuant to sections 2.23711A29 and 2.23711A7 of the Code of Virginia. Is there a motion moved by Ms. Ms. Church and seconded by Ms. Dana Koufax? All those in favor, raise your hand. The vote is unanimous. The board is in closed meeting.